on Terror, with David Cole, author of The Torture Memos. On Afterwards, the four books that caused the Cold War, John Fleming on the Anti-Communist Manifestos. Get the entire weekend schedule at booktv.org. Now, a hearing with Kenneth Feinberg. He's the Treasury Department official in charge of regulating CEO pay at the largest financial firms who received aid through the government's TARP program. Adolphus Towns of New York chairs the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Committee will come to order. Good morning. Before we begin, I would like to extend a warm welcome to a new member of the committee on the majority side, Representative Judy Chow from the 32nd District of the great state of California, which includes East Los Angeles. And Dr. Chow is a longtime elected official at the state and local level. So she brings that experience to our committee she also holds a Ph.D. in psychology. Now, you know we need her. We need that. And we need her desperately, <laughs> which also may be useful on this committee. I yield to the ranking member uh, then, and of course, and after that, I'd like to yield some time to Dr. Chow. Uh, Congressman Issa. Well, I'd like to join with the chairman in welcoming my colleague both to the committee and obviously as a fellow Californian. Uh, I might only comment that perhaps if your degree was in child psychology, it would be more useful in Congress. But we look forward to, uh, to your comments. Yield back. <laughs> we'll take any degree. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Chow. Thank you, well, thank you uh, Chairman Towns and Ranking Member Issa for that very, very warm welcome. Uh, yes. Well, actually, it's Judy Chu. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I am so grateful to be the newest member of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. This jurisdiction will allow us to delve into the major issues of the day that affect, affect our constituents and our nation, uh, such as foreclosures, the financial crisis, and government waste, fraud, and abuse. Uh, the economic downturn has hit my district hard. Uh, the number of uh, foreclosure filings in California are uh, very, very high, and in LA County it's hit 12.7 percent, uh, yet we've read for the past year how well CEOs and bank executives are, are doing, uh, and compensation levels are at an all-time high. So today's topic couldn't be more timely, and I look forward to hearing more in today's hearing as a member of this committee. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you very much, Dr. Chu, and we welcome you to the committee. There's a little doubt that executive compensation schemes were a contributing factor to the Wall Street meltdown. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Top executives had grown accustomed to receiving enormous bonuses on top of fat salaries, regardless of how their companies performed. When their companies did well, they received big, big bonuses. <clears throat> and when their companies did poorly, they still received big, big bonuses. Even the chairman of Goldman Sachs has admitted that the perverse incentives created by these schemes help send the industry into the brink. It's not surprising that the taxpayers were outraged when they realized that their money was being used to bail out companies that still plan to pay their executives millions of dollars, even though the company was not doing well. If it weren't not for taxpayers' bailouts, these companies would no longer be in existence. We wouldn't be reviewing their salary plans. We'd be reviewing their liquidation plans. After these bailouts and after the outrage last spring, you would think that the top brass would have recognized there was a problem with excessive compensation. The Obama administration made, <coughs> made a good decision when they appointed a special master, Mr. Ken Feinberg, to review executive compensation that companies reviewing taxpayers' bailouts. Mr. Feinberg performed the first review of compensation for the highest paid employees of the seven companies which received the most 
top dollars. He found what many feared, the top brass still does not understand. Another way to put it, they still don't get it. Despite record losses and near bankruptcies, the executives at these companies were still planning to cash in and continue to do business as usual. I'm happy to say that Mr. Feinberg ordered substantial cuts in their pay. No doubt there is howling in the executive suites, but I don't think the taxpayers are going to be shedding any tears over this. These huge pay packages are offensive during these difficult times and Americans are angry about it. I hear the anger in church, on the street, and wherever average Americans congregate, you hear it from them as to how angry they are about what's going on. Some on Wall Street have justified the huge pay packages by comparing themselves to superstar athletes. They will tell you Tiger Woods and A-Rod uh, uh, didn't crash the economy. Well, they haven't asked for any government bailouts either. And let me be clear, the issue today is not whether the government should dictate how much people should be allowed to earn. The issue today is whether banks that were saved from bankruptcy only by taking billions of dollars in taxpayers' money should be rewarded with a salary that gives new meaning to the word generous. It's a shame to have government get involved in bank compensation issues, but Wall Street can no longer be trusted to control themselves. Some constraints on these companies are ne necessary to protect the safety and soundness of the entire financial system. We need more than just a special master. We need to give the shareholders a way to get this under control. Today, we welcome Mr. Feinberg, who will testify about his efforts to ensure that our tax dollars are not being squandered on excessive compensation. I want to also thank Professor Black and Professor Roberts, who will likewise share their insight on executive compensation. I look forward to hearing their testimony as well. I'm certain that the most of you know the American people are really angry about what's really going on. I now yield five minutes to the committee's ranking member, Darrell Issa of California, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that mine and all members' opening statements be placed in the record in their entirety. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Chairman, I will be brief and, and paraphrase my opening statements. Uh, I join with you in the comment you made in your opening statement that we need to empower the stockholders of public companies uh, to better manage the uh, package of pay and incentive packages of their key executives. I also would say that in 1992 the word perverse perhaps uh, would be based on the efforts by this Congress to rein in pay by simply saying compensation for more than $1 million, if it is not tied to performance, would be double taxable. Although well-meaning, clearly what we have done is we have created an environment in which a board acting on behalf of their stockholders is not able to link whatever amount of money they would like to pay in a long and perhaps deferred compensation way, but rather begin by saying for their key executives, how do we work around that law? How do we link it to performance? There is an entire industry that has built up over the last almost two decades of people who in fact help key executives get more money into their incentive plans then proceed to advise boards as to whether those plans are reasonable and the upward spiral has continued. I would say that we pay often more than we need to as stockholders for the work done by key executives. But, Mr. Chairman, that is not the issue before us today. The issue before us today is do the American people have a stake in seeing that compensation is limited by these seven companies in order to ensure timely repayment of as much or all of what we have loaned to these companies as possible. Mr. Chairman, I would say that these seven companies are very different. Mr. Chairman, 
AIG will in all likelihood not return anywhere close to 100 cents in the dollars to the American people. On the other hand, it is likely that Bank of America, Goldman Sachs and others quickly returning the money uh, and, in fact, perhaps returning it sooner if we were not concerned about uh, the, the ongoing stability of our economy, we'll s would soon be likely to return the money. And as such, in my opinion, we would no longer have a legitimate right to oversee their pay and compensation. Notwithstanding that, Mr. Chairman, I would, since this committee has had a keen interest for a period of time in executive compensation and whether, in fact, the stockholders are being well represented, I would join with you gladly to continue the process of looking at whether or not public companies currently meet the obligation of ensuring that the compensation is the compensation that best is in line with the interest of the stockholders and whether or not those stockholders, if fully <coughs> informed, would validate that pay. Mr. Chairman, I believe that that is the reform that we have an ongoing nature for not necessarily any one person's pay today. I look forward to hearing from our witness and our panel to follow on whether or not we, in fact, are making the link between the $700 billion uh, TARP and the monies that have been loaned and the American people getting paid back. I hope that we all will leave today's hearing realizing that if we go too far, we endanger the American people's system of capitalism and limited free market that has allowed us to be the envy of the world. Yes, we do prevent antitrust. Yes, we do have rules of the road. And yes, we do have controls over public companies. But, Mr. Chairman, the successes of the past in America should not, in fact, be wiped away because of the sins of a few on Wall Street who, perhaps, realizing that bulls and bears were both making money, decided to become pigs. Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen, for his um, statement. Um, <clears throat> today's hearing will consist of two panels. Our first panel witnesses Mr. Kenneth R. Feinberg, who serves as a special master for TARP executive compensation. Mr. Feinberg has just completed a report regarding the compensation proposal of 25 highest paid employees of the seven recipients of exceptional assistance on the TARP. Uh, we welcome you, Mr. Feinberg, and I want to thank you for all your hard work. I can only imagine how difficult it was to balance the competing interests. I know you did not make many friends with your rulings, and I understand that. It is committee policy that all witnesses are sworn in, so if you would stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, respond in the affirmative. I do. Right. Let the record reflect that Mr. Feinberg uh, responded in the affirmative. We generally uh, move forward with the lights on. We have um, starts at green and then it goes to yellow and it turns to red. But we want you to go without the lights. We're just so anxious and eager to hear what you have to say. So why don't you just begin and then, of course, uh, uh, try to do it within 10 minutes. Okay. You, you may regret that, Mr. Chairman, without <laughs> the lights. First of all, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for inviting me and the ranking minority member for inviting me. It's an honor and a privilege to be here today, the first time I've addressed a, a committee here in the Congress on my recent report of last week. I just want to mention at the outset, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you and the ranking minority member once again for how much you helped me eight years ago during my administration of the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund. Uh, the two of you and other members of this committee were extraordinarily helpful to me in meeting with the families and um, um, discussing with them the, uh, the benefits of the 9-11 Fund. And I thank both of you, uh, really, again, for your help in that regard. I now have a new challenge, uh, executive compensation. I should say at the outset, one reason that this committee uh, hearing room is so crowded is virtually my entire staff is here. I don't think anybody is working today at Treasury from the Office of the Special Master, and um, I'm grateful for their uh, hard work and help. For the last 
five months, I have a narrow mandate under the law, and that was to determine pay compensation packages for the top 25 officials in just seven companies that received the most TARP assistance. Citigroup, AIG, Bank of America, General Motors, GMAC, Chrysler, and Chrysler Financial. That is the limit of my jurisdiction. I have no authority, no mandatory jurisdiction to determine pay for any other than these seven companies. And even as to these seven companies, only the top 25 officials in each of those companies. The report which I've submitted, which is now public, and which I've attached to my testimony, is a comprehensive report that explains in great detail the method I used and the conclusions I reached strictly following the statute passed by Congress and the accompanying Treasury regulations. In your letter of invitation, you raise three questions for me to respond to in the course of this testimony, and I will summarize my response my more detailed response is found in my written testimony. First, you asked what principles guided me in my decisions. The principles that guided me were the legal principles laid out in the statute and the accompanying regulations. Mr. Special Master, make sure that these companies, as the ranking minority mention, member mentioned, make sure these companies stay in business with compensation packages that will make them thrive, hopefully, and above all, will help them return to the taxpayers the money that was loaned to them initially. But the law also spells out that in establishing these compensation packages, I should consider various other factors. One. Let's avoid guaranteed contracts, retention payments, salaries, bonuses, commissions, long-term severance packages, etc. Let's tie as best we can compensation to performance. Let's encourage executive officials to stay on the job and continue to work at these companies. Let's establish compensation packages that will avoid excessive risk taking. These were all principles laid out in the statute that guided me in my work. And my simple summary answer to the principles and the terms and the conditions that I used in reaching my conclusions are found in the public law and the public regulations and I did my best to enforce the law and the regulations without fear and without favor. The second question you asked is, uh, how did you go about determining the compensation packages? What was the process? How did it work? Um, where did you find the companies um, uh, acceptable? Where did you find their recommendations flawed? I requested and received comprehensive submissions from each of the seven companies explaining their view of what they thought they needed for their 25 top officials in the way of a comprehensive package. I examined those submissions with the utmost care and scrutiny and I concluded that in six of the seven submissions the information requested, the, the compensation packages urged on me by these companies were contrary to the statute, contrary to the regulations, and contrary to the public interest. They were contrary because each of the submissions, or six of the seven, wanted too much cash guaranteed salary. They wanted stock that would be immediately on the day it's issued, transferable. They wanted to tie their, their, their salary and their compensation to vague, ambiguous performance standards. 
They made no mention or insufficient mention of the perks that were part of their overall salary, private airfare, golf club dues, country club dues, etc. And they demanded as part of their submission that I honor all old prior grandfathered contracts for compensation that were entered into with officials long before this law was passed and long before I arrived on the scene as the special master. So what did we do in this report? We evaluated the submissions and then we made some what I think were material changes in the overall program. First, we greatly reduced the amount of cash that would be made available to these senior officials. We reduced that cash by approximately 90 percent. Now I read with great interest in today's newspaper an article that's, that, that implied or stated that I had actually raised cash base salaries with a number of these officials. It all depends what you mean by cash base salaries. If somebody is getting cash salary guaranteed last year of three million and now they're getting under my program three hundred thousand dollars in cash that sounds to me like a ninety percent reduction. The article today cited one example of a city official where the base salary for that official according to the article was raised by the special master to $475,000, an increase of 111%. What the article does not point out is last year that same official received from Citi $13 million in cash. And under my report, that cash was reduced by 98%. So I am very comfortable in defending my report and saying that overall one of our primary objectives succeeded in this report for these seven companies was to reduce absolute guaranteed cash by 90 percent. Second, we required in addition to the cash salaries that when we issue stock in the company that is salarized stock that is part of the salary, that stock may not be cashed out for up to four years. The stock can be cashed after two years one third, three years another third, and four years the last third. We want to keep people on the job with a vested interest in the company. If you want salarized stock, the value of that stock is tied to the performance of the company and the goal, the, the ranking minority member couldn't have said it better. The goal is keeping the company moving so that the taxpayers get their money back. Third, we said no more unlimited perks. No more private jets, no more golf club dues, no more country club dues. Perks under the report are limited to $25,000 per individual. Anything more than $25,000, you've got to come back to the special master for uh, approval and monitoring of those requested excessive perks. Finally, what did we say with these companies about these old grandfathered contracts that are purportedly in the hundreds of millions of dollars? Well, we worked with the seven companies they were very, very cooperative. Very cooperative. And in almost every case, we worked out a system whereby any grandfathered amounts that were due and owing as compensation would be voluntarily rolled over into prospective stock under our rules four years before it totally vests, and we removed almost all of those grandfathered um, valid contracts and got the companies to voluntarily agree that it would be ill-advised, unwise to, to demand payment on those old contracts. And instead, in almost every case, 
we mutually agreed that those grandfathered amounts should be rolled over prospectively into future stock with a vested interest in the company. That is what we did, um, spelled out in some detail in the report. Finally, your letter of invitation, Mr. Chairman, asked me to comment on any recommendations I might have going forward in dealing with executive compensation. I should remind the committee that my first obligation, right now underway, under the law, is to design a compensation structure for officials 26 to 100 in each of these seven companies. Right now, we are actively doing that. By the end of this year, we will have designed and implemented not individual pay packages for 26 to 100, but overall compensation structure for employees 26 to 100 in these seven companies. Then, uh, if the Secretary of the Treasury so requests, I will turn my attention immediately in January to compensation packages for 2010 for these same seven companies and the 25 individuals in 2010 that are covered by the statute. So those two objectives, 26 to 100, 2010, the law spells out expressly those are part of my ongoing uh, obligations. I want to just finally address a point that uh, the ranking minority member just made. I do not believe that this law should be extended to encompass other companies. The law was enacted to deal with the taxpayers of this country as creditors of these seven companies. And whatever one might think about whether or not it's a good idea or a bad idea for the federal government to be involved in setting compensation for private companies. I, I suggest that what Congress was stating was that this is an exception. These seven companies are owned by the taxpayer. And the taxpayer, as creditors, are asking these companies to, to rein in compensation and come up with compensation packages that will maximize the likelihood, first and foremost, that the taxpayers will get their money back. And that is my primary objective. I do not believe, as the administration has stated elsewhere, that we should be micromanaging other companies in the private sector. I'm hoping that the report that I issued and the recommendations that I've made as to these seven companies will have some effect voluntarily in in um, influencing how the private sector goes about establishing compensation practices. And my, one of my objectives is hopefully that with my recommendations, other companies on Wall Street and elsewhere will take to heart what I have suggested, what is mandated for these seven companies, and hopefully uh, the, uh, the model that is created in my report uh, will um, trickle and expand beyond these seven companies. But I agree with the minority member that um, I'm perfectly comfortable, thank you, limited to these seven companies. And uh, that's enough work for me. And I'm hopeful that uh, the committee will find my report helpful and useful. I am prepared to answer any questions. And frankly, I am prepared in the weeks and months ahead to work with this committee, um, to, to um, consult with the committee uh, as the committee deems appropriate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this thank summary. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony, and thank you for the job that you've done. Um, um, of course, um, let me begin by asking you, um, do they really get it that the fact that the American people are angry about this excessive pay? Well, you, you'll, you'll, you'll have to ask the seven companies uh, I found that the submissions uh, did not adequately address uh, the, the major concerns expressed by the American people. Right. How do you deal with the contract situation now, where you person has a contract and um, which has been signed, and of course now all of a sudden you, um, that you're asking that he gives back? I mean, what was the reaction to that, or how did you handle it? 
The law that was enacted gives me three options when it comes to old contracts for compensation that were entered into long before this law was passed and my office was created. First, I examine the contract to determine whether or not in my independent judgment I found the contract to be valid or not. I want the committee to understand that the sanctity of contract under the Constitution is very, very important and I was loath to find contracts invalid when they were entered into years ago between officials and the company. So there was not a case where I terminated or invalidated a contract. But that's just the beginning of the inquiry, Mr. Chairman. The law then said, if I found a contract valid, I could, under the law, attempt with the company and the official to renegotiate that contract voluntarily. That worked very well. With, a, with, with, with one or two or three exceptions, in every single case, the company worked with me and my staff in renegotiating those old contracts so that they would be turned into stock in the company moving forward and would be subject to the same rules and restrictions as 2009 salarized stock. Then the law said, if a company refused to negotiate a valid contract, and that was very, very rare, the law permitted me, I have to honor that contract, but the law permitted me to take that contract amount into consideration in setting 2009 salary. And that's what I did in those cases. You want that contract enforced, it's a valid contract, the Constitution protects it, okay. But I am going to look at the amount of that contract and I am going to factor into my perspective 2009, 2010 salaries, the fact that, you, that we had to honor that contract because it wasn't renegotiated. And I think we've done that fairly successfully. Right. Thank you very much. And um, uh, this is on AIG. Can you do anything to stop AIG from paying nearly $180 million in bonuses next year to employees in the very AIG division most responsible for the failure of AIG, um, that is the uh, financial products division. Um, you pose a question which the special master will have to address very quickly in 2010 when those allegedly guaranteed contracts come up. And we're going to have to see with AIG, and, and let me just say, AIG has been quite cooperative in this process. They, they, we've met with them numerous times. Um, we will have to sit down with AIG uh, in 2010, in a couple of months, January. And uh, I am admonished by your question, Mr. Chairman, that this committee is looking at these contracts and we will see what we can work out with AIG going forward uh, in an effort to uh, satisfy the statute, satisfy the regulations, satisfy the American people, and um, I view that as a top priority. Because you have to recognize, you know, um, uh, people feel that if you failed, that you should not be rewarded for your failure. And of course, um, and that's a big issue, and that's why the American people are so angry because in many instances, the government is now bailing out people, of course, who fail, and they're getting a bonus. I now yield to the ranking member, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to go through something before I actually wage into questions, just because I want to set the tone of this hearing so that it not be uh, in any way uh, confrontational. Is it fair to say, and I'm going to make the assumption it is, but I'll ask you for confirmation, General Motors was bankrupt, Chrysler was bankrupt, and their financial uh, divisions, their uh, GMAC and so on, not because of the financial crisis. They were already in trouble, had a real problem with their cost of doing business, et cetera, and then they were caught up in that last nail in the coffin. So four out of your seven companies, it's fair to say 
These are companies that, that are bankrupt and not even directly related to the collapse, but tangentially related to the collapse and as such are under your purview. Is that fair to say? I guess it's fair to say, uh, Congressman, I, I, I have enough problems focusing on an executive comp without figuring out exactly what caused the bankruptcies, but I guess that the assumption in your question is accurate, okay. yes. And, and secondly, we own those companies because whatever amount we took, we took and do not expect to get it all back because we put a lot into them that is not coming back, particularly Chrysler, I think, notably. That's correct. Uh, or Chrysler Division of Fiat, however you want to put it. So I'm going to leave those companies alone for a moment. Uh, and I'm going to concentrate on the big three. AIG is, when in my opening statement I said that AIG was unlikely to return all of the money, do you share that with us, that you're trying to maximize the return but without an expectation that we're going to, whether we pay them a little or a lot, we're not probably going to get $180 billion back? I think that's right, and I think that in the submissions that AIG provided us and in our conversations with AIG, uh, that is a fair assumption. Okay. so. Again, we own 80 percent of AIG. We're not likely to get paid all, the, all back. You're managing it on behalf of the stockholders, which are the American people. Okay, we'll go to the top two. City, it now looks like, was really in a lot more trouble than people understood. B of A, not so much. Fair to say. B of A is likely to return all the money and over a period of time that is reasonably maybe three years or whatever. City, there's still a little bit of, of doubt. So when you're managing all seven of these, do you manage them to maintain the best 25 people to maximize the return to the American people? I deal with each of the seven differently, as you point out. And you are absolutely right that my primary statutory obligation is to set compensation so that the taxpayer gets their money back. That is correct. And, and now I get into the, a little bit harder part of this. Looking at B of A and AIG, more than half of their top 25 people have left. Does it concern you that many of those people had contracts and they had to, they had to balance, okay, I can, I can make nothing going forward or I can renegotiate my contract or I can take what I'm entitled to and leave? Do you believe that, that, that this limitation that was put on to your maneuverability led to some of those people leaving and has it hurt, it's hard to measure, hurt having that question of do we have the best 25 people to maximize the return to the American people? I can't answer that question because I'm not sure the vagaries and the, 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 the various reasons that people leave a company. They may have left because they didn't want to be under the thumb of the special master. They may have left because you're so nice. Well, I'm sorry? Well. That's what you said. Yeah. Um, they may have left because they had another job opportunity. They may have left because they didn't even want the public glare. I don't know the reasons they okay. left, but I agree with you, um, um, Congressman. I said that, that it is a concern. Yes. Well, following up on that concern, because the, de the details of what you, the breadth and width of what you can negotiate, Ford is doing better. And Ford is innovating, and Ford is able to be sort of the standalone one American company that didn't, that isn't under scrutiny. Are you concerned that they will hire the best and the brightest from Chrysler and GM? Similarly, with only City, AIG, and B of A, and we'll leave AIG out, but City and B of A under your direct control, is it very possible that some of these individuals will leave the best for? better pay, and as a result, yes, we'll get people to work for the wages we set, but will we, in fact, be hurting B of A's long-term uh, future on behalf of the stockholders, of which we are only t a temporary stockholder? Yes. And the statute agrees with you in spelling out that one important factor I must consider is the retention and attraction of good people to these companies in order for them to thrive and repay the American taxpayer. Mr. Chairman, if I could ask just one quick follow-up. If that's the case, should we look at a statute that envisions, particularly as to City and B of A, a vote of the stockholders or some kind of affirmation by the long-term stockholders of these companies that, in fact, they agree with the pay packages we're setting as in the best interest? Obviously, the board commenting, you commenting, but 
leave something to those stockholders that the chairman and I both said we had to further empower into the pay decision. You and other members of Congress are now looking at this whole question of corporate governance, how to empower shareholders, independent compensation committees, independent consultants on comp. Uh, that whole area of corporate governance uh, is something that is worthy of consideration by Congress, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Th thank you very much. I'm wondering if Wall Street will curb its excessive bonus culture without government intervention, I mean, based on what he was saying. You think that will happen? Again, uh, it's a murky crystal ball, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Congressman Clay from Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Feinberg, for being here. I, uh, I applaud your diligence uh, in the difficult task that was set before you of reeling in excessive executive compensation uh, is an important mission and is of great benefit to our economy and to the American taxpayer. Uh, I continue to be alarmed by the reported trends in executive compensation that expose the disproportionate uh, nature of corporate pay packages. According to the research, uh, pay to CEOs is at an all-time high at over 400 times the average worker's pay. How has executive pay grown to these extreme amounts and what factors contributed to these trends? I'm not a historian in terms of uh, the causes of the growth. Uh, I confronted under the statute and the regulations clear uh, uh, directives to rein in uh, compensation while at the same time making sure these companies repay the taxpayer. Uh, others have written on the various reasons that the gap has grown between executive compensation and line workers. Uh, uh, and I've tried to take that into account in, in uh, limiting uh, executive comp in, uh, under my mandate. You know, I have long been concerned about guaranteed bonuses. Uh, as we have seen with AIG, guaranteed bonuses and incentives do not seem to encourage productivity. Aren't guaranteed bonuses of any kind inconsistent with effective risk management? Well, I think they are. I don't know about of any kind. There may be some that haven't crossed my desk. But you will find in my report, I think it's fair to say, other than base cash salary, a complete rejection of the notion of guaranteed compensation. Uh, instead, we tie the overwhelming amount of compensation for these executive officials to performance, not guarantees, and have worked as best we can to eliminate guaranteed payments as part of any compensation package. In, in order to hold TARP recipients fully responsible, is there any possibility of nullifying prior payment obligations to executives? Yes, we've been very successful in doing that. As I mentioned to the chairman and the ranking minority member, in almost every case where we confronted a prior guaranteed contract, we were able to negotiate voluntarily with the companies and get them to yield on that guaranteed contract and instead roll that amount into stock going forward over four years tied to performance. Have, have any employees or recipients taken legal action because of your, uh, because of those corporations' actions? No. No? No. Okay. Um, we're very persuasive. <laughs> uh, have the, the um, huge bonuses led to a, uh, a culture of entitlement? In other words, do executives now expect packages like this regardless of performance? I think huge guaranteed bonuses undercut performance. If you're guaranteed a huge cash salary or you're guaranteed a bonus regardless of performance, or your guaranteed commission payments regardless of sales. I think that what we learned is that undercuts the statutory directive that we tie compensation more to the overall financial health of these seven companies. And that's what we tried to do in the report. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your response, Mr. Thank you. Feinberg. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. 
Thank you very much. And now I yield to the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Burton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, here's a quote by an executive from one of the companies. He says, there's no question people have left because of uncertainty of our ability to pay. It's a highly competitive market out there. One of the things that concerns me is that you have top talent. And you said that you had some people that were making, what, $13 million and you cut them down to 350000 or something like that. Why would anybody in their right mind, if they're an executive for a company like that who has the talent to manage and run a company, why would they take a pay cut from $13 million down to 350000 And does that damage the company? Absolutely it would damage the company, and that isn't what we did. What we did is we took... 13, uh, Congressman Burton, we took $13 million in guaranteed cash, reduced it to $350,000 in guaranteed cash, and told that executive, we'll give you $13 million or $9 million or $8 million, I don't know the exact amount, in stock. Now, you're, you have a vested interest in that stock. If that stock over the next four years goes up, you may get more than, than well, this. Let me, let me interrupt. So we tried to tie it. Yeah. Well, uh, if a person uh, has a, 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 a contract, uh, and you said, I think you used the term alleged contracts, if they have a contract that uh, guarantees a certain amount of money, and you say you want them to renegotiate that and pay them $350,000, what would be the rationale for them to take the $350,000 and not go ahead with the contract and take their money? The rationale would be, A, that they want to stay at the company and redeem that stock in value that may be even more than $13 million. Well, I, I, I can understand that you believe these people have, uh, have uh, the best interests of the company at heart, and, and probably they do. But when you're talking about that kind of a, a cut and whether or not somebody could get that money immediately within the contract, uh, it seems to me that most people would take the money and run. And as I said before, this quote says very clearly that they said it's a highly competitive market out there and uh, they're jumping ship. Now, if they jump ship and you don't have top talent running these companies, the American taxpayer, who's the majority stockholder, has inferior people running the company. Doesn't that concern you? It sure does. So and what do you do about that? I think that if you look at the, uh, at, at the uh, levels of total compensation that we established in our determination, we think it, I made this recommendation, or my conclusion, they won't jump ship. They won't. I well, think they already, that they already have. Some okay. have, before well, my recommendations. Yeah, well, first of all, I mean, I understand you're doing what you've been uh, instructed to do, but it doesn't make any sense to me if somebody has a contractual uh, a guarantee of a certain amount of money that they're going to take $350,000 and then say, okay, I'll take it in stock when you have an economy like we have right now and they can take the money and go. And if they go to another company, they can make the same, same amount of money or maybe even more than they were making where they are. So the top talent, it seems to me, would be encouraged to leave. Now, the other thing I wanted to ask you is this. Who do you answer to when you make these decisions? Under the law, I make these, these, I have final authority, non-appealable, these decisions are mine and mine alone. I serve at the discretion of the Secretary of the Treasury. But he doesn't have, I mean, once you make a decision, you don't say to him, this is what my recommendation is, you just, the decision is final. Under the law as written, the regulations afford me final binding authority to issue those determinations. That, that's a Treasury regulation. It's not a law, is it not? That's the Treasury regulations that de de uh, evolve out of the statute, yes. Yeah, but, but, but the point is, as far as accountability is concerned, and I'm not inferring that you're not doing a good job, I'm just saying that you really don't answer to anybody. Well, I answer to this committee and other committees with oversight well, functions. On, let's, let's, let's be straight about this. You, you, you the, you're the czar. You make the decision, that's it, right? Under the law, I make the decision. Okay. So if these people leave these companies because they are not being compensated as was in the contract, and I'm saying, not saying they didn't make too much money and they were accountable and didn't do their job properly. I'm just saying when you need top talent to run a company like General Motors or, or Chrysler or AIG, you want people there that can really do the job. Now, they may not have done their job right in the past, 
but they may have the knowledge and the talent to do the job. And you're saying to them, here, we're going to renegotiate your contract and you take $350,000 and we'll extend it and give you stock for the $13 million that you, you were going to get. And they say, hey, the heck with that. I want my money and I'm going to leave. And so you have people that don't have the knowledge and the competence to run that company. And so the stockholders, the American people, are in danger of seeing their money, the, the TARP money, going down the tubes because the company doesn't respond. My response to you, Congressman, is this. I have tried my best in this report to implement that statutory directive that they stay on the job and that the taxpayer get his money back. I'll defend these recommendations. Now, you may say, if I were doing your job, I would have a different level of compensation or do it differently? Fine. I did the best I could to try and maximize the very objective you're stating which is keep these people on the job, and I think we've done that. Mr. Chairman, yeah, may I yeah. have one, one final question, please? Yeah, uh, I'd be okay. delighted to yield to yeah. the gentleman an additional minute. The Federal, the Federal Reserve's issued guidelines under which the Fed would review, if necessary, or amend or reject the compensation policies of all banks regulated by the Fed. Are you familiar with that? Uh, that's just come out last week, yes. Yeah, that really concerns me because what we're talking about is you or somebody going beyond where you are right now and regulating people that did not get TARP money simply because they're regulated by the Fed. What do you think about that? Congressman, my limit, what I'm doing to these seven and only these seven companies, what the Federal Reserve is, is proposing or whatever is not on my watch and uh, um, you'll have to ask the Federal Reserve about the, the scope of those regulations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and now you'll um, five minutes to the gentlewoman from Ohio. Ms. Marcy Kapture. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, Mr. Feinberg, thank you for coming today. From whom did you receive the first call suggesting you be appointed to your present position? I received the first call from the Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, Neil Wolin. All right, and who else did you hear from prior to your appointment? Uh, the only other person is the Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, and approximately when did those calls happen? Earlier this year? I'm sorry? When did those calls happen? Earlier this year? Yes, I think about five or six months ago. All right. Is your federal position classified as Schedule C or are you classified as civil service or some other category? Special government employee. Special government employee? Yes. Does that mean you have a special contract with the Treasury? I believe that is the case. All right. And that's a matter of public record? Yes, it is. Thank you. Uh, for whom did you work uh, prior to your current position? I was in a private law firm in private practice. Okay. And could you state the name of that firm for the record, Yes. The please? name of the firm is Feinberg Rosen LLP. All right. And where are they located? Washington, D.C. and New York City. New York City. Where's their principal headquarters? Washington, D.C. Do you have any relationship with that firm now? Uh, yes. All right. Could you state the relationship of that I, firm? I am the founding partner of the firm. Your founding partner. Yes. Is it true uh, that um, three of the institutions whose compensation you are supervising are or have been clients of that firm, including Citigroup, Citibank, AIG, and Bank of America with the acquisition of Merrill Lynch? No, that is not true. That is not true? No. Uh, it has been reported in the press that that is actually the case. So it been the, in client the press, it's list, not true. It's not true. Are any of the institutions under your pur purview? Um, have they been clients of that company? No. They have not. All right. Uh, let me ask you, you stated that it's a good idea to tie the um, stock opportunities for employees of these companies to a four-year term. All right. And you said it pays out a third in what year? A third after two years, a third after three years, and a third after four years. All right. You know, that doesn't sound very long-term to me. How did you arrive at four years? Well, it was, it's a very difficult question. We concluded that asking individuals to delay the payment of their salary beyond a fourth year would simply work too much of a hardship, that, that, that uh, it is a problem of, of keeping them on the job and trying to get the taxpayer's money back. We concluded that a four-year payout of salary was uh, a fair limitation. 
Now what we also did, Congresswoman, which is implicit in your question, we also required that any additional stock that might be issued to these uh, officials, it would not vest for at least three years and would not be redeemable at all until top loan money was repaid to the taxpayer. So that was the balance we struck. Um, I don't, I guess I just find it surprising, you know, if you look at a two-year time horizon, a three-year time horizon, a four-year time horizon, and the way I look at the world, that isn't a very long time at all. Well, it, 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 it may not be a long time, I guess it's relative, but our concern um, uh, uh, was that if we are reducing compensation for these officials across the board by about 50 percent and we are obligated to keep these companies in business to repay loan taxpayer money that asking uh, these officials to wait more than four years to redeem their salarized stock was simply too onerous. Now maybe it should have been five years or six years. We thought four years was a pretty good compromise. On the outer edge, but on the inner edge it's two years. You were quoted in the U New York Times uh, October 23rd stating anybody making a hundred million dollars a year is engaged in excessive risk. Uh, you approve compensation packages worth nine million or more for six executives including one at AIG, two at Bank of America, and three at Citigroup. That $9 million is 23 times as much as the pay for the President of the United States, 46 times the pay for the Fed Chair and Treasury Secretary, and more than 50 times as much as a military general. How did you determine that that amount was not contrary to the public interest? Well, we did it in a number of ways. First, we gathered all the data we could gather and examine the data as to what constitute competitive marketplace uh, compensation. Then what we did is we made sure that that nine million or eight million was not guaranteed compensation. The cash component of that nine million is likely to be five hundred thousand dollars or less. The rest of it, as Congressman Burton pointed out, the rest of it is tied to stock which cannot be redeemed at once, has to be held two, three, four years, and a big chunk of that compensation cannot be redeemed by the official until and unless top money is repaid to the taxpayer. So it may be nine million in theory, but in practice we believe it will be a lot less than that. Thank you, thank time you, Mr. Expired. Chairman. I General would like to place in the record information we have about the clients of uh, the gentleman's uh, law firm and uh, would appreciate response. Thank you so thank very, you very much. Thank you very much. Without objection. Gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Souter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm, I'm sure it doesn't uh, shock Mr. Uh, Feinberg that uh, some of us on the Republican side have uh, uh, as outraged as we are about the salaries, as outraged as we are about the uh, corruption and the crisis that was triggered by greed, that we have deep uncomfortability about the government in effect taking over the majority of these companies or having somebody setting their salaries. I, I will say um, the word czar does fit you and you seem to fit comfortably in the word czar uh, as uh, we've uh, debated because if you don't have anybody directly that you're reporting to and you're uh, explaining how you make uh, these decisions, but it's still, uh, what, a little scary as an elected official or as people watching in the country to see one person with this uh, much power over major institutions in our society and the, uh, the uh, challenges to how are you making decisions, who are you talking to, uh, why aren't you reporting to any elected official directly in the Treasury Department or the President uh, is not a good precedent for democracy. Now let me ask you a, uh, a fundamental question. AIG is, we talk about it like it's one company. In reality it's what, 80 financial and 120 insurance or the other way around. Did you separate out in this top 25 those who, ha and not all divisions were, were bad, uh, that did you separate out um, which divisions actually caused the problem? Uh, same at Bank of America. Bank of America, Citibank, had traditional banking things that were regulated and their compensation might have been fair inside that industry. But they had these non-bank 
rogue divisions that went crazy. Are you doing all 25 evaluations as if it's one institution rather than, in fact, separate institutions, some of which clearly caused the problem and some of which didn't because of incompetent management? Under the law, I'm looking at the top 25 compensated individuals at AIG as the parent. In other words, I'm not looking at seven people at this unit and five people at that unit in determining the top 25. That was really submitted to us by the company itself under the law. In other words, we from that. my question is then Congress didn't separate. We blended them all together. Now, let me uh, go back because what the American people are frustrated with was that we had, and I voted for TARP every time it's come up, okay? Because I believe our country is going to collapse because some of these people didn't look at basic, you know, economies growing at 16 percent over four years, housing is going up at 200 percent. What kind of incompetent person can't figure out that people may, for example, be self reporting income? How in the world nobody looked at the risk of securitization? Why didn't they uh, ask in, in the, the bonding companies that we've had in here, the rating companies, why didn't anybody at these different companies say, hey, isn't it strange that these companies are getting AAA for selling us bad credit? Why were they only checking 10 to 20 percent and then paying bonuses if you cleared these? The question I have is, are we aimed at the wrong thing? Why are we looking at compensation here rather than do you think we could have looked at, because one of the questions, oh, we have to pay these people this or they'll go to another company. What about stigma here, that you were incompetent? Wouldn't we have been better off analyzing what actually went wrong in these companies, finding out which managers were clearing it, holding them accountable by whether they performed their basic duty or whether they looked the other way to get profit in their company, and in effect through investigations, whether it was violation of the law or incompetence, putting a stigma on them, and all of a sudden pay would have been different. The problem in an oligopolistic situation right now is you don't have pure capitalism working. The, the bonding companies didn't work like capitalism was supposed to work. The stockholders and the boards weren't paying enough attention. In an investigation here, isn't the real problem not the compensation, but that people who did crummy jobs aren't being singled out. The, the next tier of management, wink, wink, the next tier of management, wink, wink, and you're treating in Bank of America and Citibank and AIG those who participated in this huge cover-up and incompetence the same as those who were running the traditional banking part, and they're all part of the parent. Congressman, I can only say in response to your... Um, I ask your opinion, though, not just what you're required to by law. Well. But, I mean, I think that is a fair answer. I, I'm, I'm confronted with a statute and some regulations, and I'm asked to very sp expressly and specifically deal with what Congress has asked me to deal with. You're, you're raising some I'm, very good questions. I'm asking you, you're inside now. You're looking at these. You've got to be measuring these different execs, and one of them maximized his return and, in fact, could go over to Chase or somebody. Uh, if you're trying to keep them there, um, don't you look at whether they were competent in their area? In other words, if you adjusted some of their pay by whether or not they were over an area that, that unbelievably rewarded people who were behind in their mortgages as more value in securitization than people who were paying. Now, that is some kind of stupidity, no risk management, yet you're analyzing and people, uh, isn't that one of the variables, even under statute, that would measure whether or not they're employable? I think to the extent that you're asking, do we also look at the importance, the role of the individual, how long they've been at the company, what capacity they served? Yes, we do look at that. Did they You're handle these toxic things and overlook? I also think, if I may, Congressman, you're raising an, implicitly, you're raising a very important question raised earlier, which is the extent to which, quite apart from my compensation decisions, what about corporate governance reform designed to rein in the discretion of some of these officials? And that is a subject which is, of course, worthy of and is now being considered by Congress. Right. Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Cuellar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Feinberg, for being here with us. And I understand you have a very difficult job, and I appreciate it. Uh, I guess if I can look at the scenario, this is what the scenario is. You have uh, companies that have received TARP dollars, uh, companies that have not received TARP dollars, and, and of course you have the regulators also, the federal regulators. And, and I guess the basic premise is if you received federal dollars, therefore we can dwell into your compensation. 
uh, regardless of your performance or not. And if you have not received federal uh, uh, TARP dollars, then we're not going to get into the free market forces. Is that pretty much correct? Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, we're, we talked about compensation, and I think in the past when IAG took off all, you know, those remember those conferences that they went off, and and there was an outrage from the public saying, why are they going to those uh, conferences and meeting those uh, luxurious uh, uh, resorts? People were saying, you, you got to watch out how you spend those dollars. You understand? You remember yes, that? Yes, I remember that. All right. Um, so. I guess one of the things that we have to look as legislators is sometimes the public looks at perception saying, if you all are the regulators, then you have to watch what you do also. Um, and I'm just reading something that just came out in the Washington Post. Uh, I believe that, uh, I think it was on October 19th, uh, the uh, Fed Chairman Ben Bernick and I think about uh, several of his employees went to a October 19th it was on October 19th, San Francisco Fed Conference on Asian and Global Financial Situation. Uh, they went and they traveled to the Baccarat Resort and Spa near Santa Barbara. They're in California, I guess. Some of those suites go up to $2,000 a night, and you can go on and on and on and on and on. Um, I think uh, out of the 100 participants there, I believe one-third of the participants there were federal employees. Uh, whether they got good discounts on the hotel rooms that was not during the season, uh, you know, I guess, and I know that's not under your watch, and I don't mean to put you on this, but I guess that's one of the things we got to be very, very careful because if you have TARP, non-TARP entities, and then you have the federal regulators saying you got to watch what you do and spend the money, we just have to be very careful how we regulate. Any comments without you going to uh, I, I completely I, I com completely agree with your comment about being careful. I assure you that the Office of the Special Master is very, very cognizant of your concern about image and how it looks with the regulators. And um, I can't speak for the Federal Reserve, but I can tell you that our office is very cognizant of that concern about perks and excessive uh, compensation, travel allowances, etc. Thank you very much. Thank you. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Feinberg, for your testimony. I appreciate your how candid you are. Um, and uh, I was saying to a colleague that uh, your extreme confidence is uh, necessary with the extreme job that you have. Um, but I also appreciate you just being frank with us, and that's what we need. Um, now, in, in terms of, I just want to touch on a couple things quickly, and I've got some other questions, but um, you report to the Secretary of the Treasury. He's your boss. Is that correct? correct? How often do you meet with uh, Secretary Geithner? Uh, I've met with the Secretary probably three or four times in the last five months. In, in the last how many months? Five months. Five months. Okay. Um, so every other month, roughly. Okay. Um, and and in, in terms of um, this discussion about cash, Okay, and your in your testimony you discuss cash. Okay, and when people hear that, and when I read the Wall Street Journal story, I think that the language differential here is important. The distinction you're talking about cash as your daily, your monthly salary or weekly salary, however they pay, and then if you get a cash bonus at the end of the year, that's your cash package. Correct. Correct. Okay, now. The Wall Street Journal story that you reference in your opening statement says that you raise the base pay for, for uh, 89 individuals, you cut it for a couple others, you left it the same for others. That is their base salary that they receive monthly, is that correct? Uh, th that's what the Wall Street Journal says. My, my definition of base salary is quite different. My definition of base salary is not only what you get twice a month, but also drawers that may be provided you over the course of the year, guaranteed commissions, guaranteed bonuses. The example, Congressman, that the, Waltz, that the uh, news article referred to said that in one case with Citibank, I had raised the base salary to, uh, by 111% mm -hmm. to $475,000. I pointed out earlier to the committee that the total cash that that person, that official received last year was $13 million, and I reduced it by 98 percent. And, and that, that $13 million figure is not uh, any stock awards. 
That was cash. That was cash. Cash. Okay. All right. I just want to understand this distinction because I read here, uh, I read in the Wall Street Journal one, one story, and then I hear your testimony, which is different. I just want to understand, you're talking about that twice a month. Their comparison here is the twice, twice a month pay or monthly pay to what you're now setting as their monthly pay. I guess that's right. It's unclear to me in that story okay. what they mean. So what you're looking at is you, you would up that base uh, uh, guarantee uh, in that factor, but the rest you're, you're, you're having with stock. Now, I'm right. also eliminating all cash guarantees, like bonuses guaranteed regardless of performance, like commissions guaranteed regardless of sales, like any other type of cash guarantee, those are completely eliminated under my program. Okay, I want to, I want to discuss a larger issue here. Uh, do you use compensation consultants within your office? In the office of the special master? Yes. yes. Okay. Are these, this, uh, are, are these compensation consultants uh, that have other clients? No, now, they're, no they're, uh, they may have clients that I'm not aware of. They're both academics. Both academics. Okay. All right. Now, in terms of compensation consultants, there's been a lot of discussion about this. Okay. But I think there's another piece here, which is the tax ramifications for salary and bonuses. Have you encountered this as a challenge in dealing with these institutions? We certainly have. Can you discuss, t because we're in Congress here, we set the tax rules. What can we do to make the tax code uh, more effective so that executives' actions are tied to shareholders' interests? Well, that's a, a complicated question about the tax code. I'd have to get back to you on that. I can tell you that you're absolutely right, Congressman, that, that we run into these problems every day in establishing deferred compensation. You know, it, it may vest today under the law, but it's not redeemable for two years, three years, four years. What are the tax consequences of this? And we've run into that problem. And I'll be glad to, uh, you know, get back to you and lay out some of the tax uh, issues that have arisen in the course of my five months on the job. No, I'd, I'd certainly appreciate that. I will. Uh, finally, the, the, the number of 25, okay? I find it arbitrary. Do you find it arbitrary? Yeah, of, uh, it's, uh, okay. of course you, it's, it's have arbitrary. You, have you encountered this as a problem where you have two executives, one makes marginally more than the other, uh, one's the number 26th executive, the other's the number 25th, and then perhaps you have a class of people that, that are very similar to what uh, the, the 20th or 25th executive that, that fall under your purview. Have you seen anything uh, with currently that you have the, the 26th executive making more than the people that you have you've just given new rules to. No, we haven't seen that yet. Of course, we haven't yeah. got to the new top 25 in 2010, yeah. Yeah. which may vary. Uh, we haven't seen the problem yet of uh, the difference between number 25 and 26. What we are seeing is the arbitrariness of 26 to 100 when the hundredth person is cut off at 100 and there may be hundreds or thousands of employees at 101 and 102 and 1,000 and 5,000 and 10,000 that are subject to the same compensation structure. So we're running into that problem a little bit, but hopefully we'll be able to come up with a program that'll take that into account. Thank you for time has expired. And Mr. Chairman, if I, if I may submit for the record uh, a question I have about comp uh, about contracting out uh, services that are not under your purview as well. Right. Without objection, so ordered. Now recognize the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Feinberg. I thank you and I thank your, your staff for the tremendous work that you've been doing. We, I think we all really appreciate it. Uh, I, have, I have questions in two areas, but first a brief statement. Uh, trying to figure out what's the quote right level of compensation obviously ultimately uh, is an arbitrary decision. Uh, but there's been a premise in corporate America that the more you're paid, the more you're worth. Uh, disgraced uh, and incompetent executives who walked away with hundreds of millions of dollars, Stanley Neal, Richard Fold, the list goes on, uh, have proven that to be wrong. Uh, and I think the two concerns that we have here in Congress are one, what compensation practices are going to 
drive a constructive business model so that bankers make money by lending rather than ripping folks off on kite schemes like subprime mortgages. And then number two, uh, with respect to the taxpayer bailout, uh, which uh, was presented to us uh, as something that had to be done even if we didn't want to do it, how can we get some of that money back for the American taxpayer? And uh, this isn't in your purview, but it's a question I want to ask because you probably have more practical experience on this than anyone in America and certainly more than any of us on the committee. Among the TARP recipients was Goldman Sachs. They've since paid that money back with interest. And Goldman Sachs is good at what it does, and it's now on track to have another year of record profits and likely to award bonuses in the range of 21 to 23 billion dollars to its employees. Part of their bottom line profit came from a taxpayer payment to AIG, over 100 billion dollars. AIG took the taxpayer money and wrote a 12.9 billion dollar check to Goldman to cover collateral uh, uh, debt obligations uh, in some of these exotic instruments that were in jeopardy uh, because of the collapse of AIG. Do you have an opinion as to whether or not uh, Goldman Sachs uh, should repay taxpayers that $12.9 billion before it awards $21 billion in bonuses to its employees? Uh, Congressman, I don't have an opinion. Um, I'm a, I, I've read that, that, that story just as others have. Um, I have enough difficulty uh, focusing on the seven companies that are on my watch. And whether or not Goldman should either voluntarily or by force of Congress, congressional directive, um, repay. Well, let me um, ask you this. I, I understand you have a limited purview, and, and I can't tell you that nobody's listening, and it's just between us. <laughs> but I know that one of your concerns is taxpayer fairness. And again, that's in the eye of the beholder, but it's a fairness standard. And one of the things that we've learned in this entire catastrophe of the financial meltdown is that most of the things that were done that are truly outrageous and harmful to taxpayers in our economy were all legal. Legal, but not fair and not right. And if we're going to restore some sense of fairness that the American taxpayer needs, do you think that we've got to address uh, such transfers where the goal of the taxpayer bailout was to revive the financial system, but not to reward any individual firm. Yes, I'm hopeful that the model that we have developed for the seven companies that's in this report, and executive compensation is not the answer to all of these problems, but to the extent that executive compensation is, uh, uh, has a, a role to play going forward in, in, in um, in improving the economy and, and, and in promoting fairness. I'd like to think that the recommendations we have made in this report might be adopted voluntarily by other companies uh, on Wall Street and might be seen as one step among many that can be taken uh, to deal with the overall problem. Okay, thank you. I yield back to, thank you, Mr. Feinberg. Thank you very much. I now yield to the gentleman from California, Congressman Bill Bray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Feinberg, I guess with my wife on the other side of the continent, I spent some quality time with Publius uh, Hamilton and the Federalist Papers last night, and I'm just thinking of what our founding fathers must be thinking watching um, the entire process uh, that we're talking about today. The concept of the federal government is actually looking at these kind of private sector jurisdictions that have changed. And I think rightfully so, we should be looking at it. I mean, I think one of the greatest things when you read the Federalist Papers is this concept of rights and responsibilities go together. And when the taxpayer was required to take on responsibilities, those rights got, you know, obviously start following. And I appreciate you working on this part of it, uh, breaking very new ground. Let's just hope it's not ground that we, we have to cover ever again in the future, and let's work on that. I, I think that your comment about the regulation that we're considering, one of the concerns I see is re basically continuing the process of the federal government deciding salary rather than empowering stockholders who are actually the ones who bear the financial responsibility and should have that. Wouldn't you agree that is the vehicle that we probably should be looking at is those who pay, play, and be determine who get 
We I get, think that's right. As I said earlier, the asterisk to that general view, which I share, is that at least as to these seven companies, Congress spoke and said that since the taxpayer is the primary creditor of these seven companies who received the most TARP assistance, as to these seven and only these seven, there should be more monitoring and determination of pay. Because rights and responsibilities, the, fi the fiscal responsibility um, leads the, the, um, the right to be able to intervene. Uh, what worries some of us is that we are starting to see this as being an excuse to intervene in other companies where the responsibility has not been taken over, but the right is, is being proposed to be preempted. I can't speak for the Federal Reserve or others. I know that I have publicly uh, again today expressed the view that my jurisdiction should not be extended beyond these seven companies and only as long as they still owe the taxpayers money. And I appreciate that. How many members of your team were drawn from the private law firm, um, from, from your private law firm? And uh, I think myself and two others. Can you, you, would you mind naming them? Uh, Ms. Camille Byros, who's sitting right here and Ms. Jacqueline Zins, who is also sitting next to Ms. Byros. Okay. The rest are all Treasury officials. Okay. All the rest of them are Treasury officials? Yes, I believe do so. You, do you have the names of the Treasury officials? Um, they are all here. I can get you those names. Okay. Yes. Appreciate that. Um, now, there's a lot of reports been going around, but um, latest is, um, it's, according to those reports, your team, your team includes academic cons um, consultants. Two. Uh, Professor Ju um, Lucian Bebchek from Harvard and Profe uh, Professor Kevin Murphy from the University of Southern California. Hey, right. I appreciate that. And that is the kind of clarity I think that President Obama really wanted to set as a new example, rightfully so, pointing out the previous administrations have not been as transparent as we hope. Um, and that creates concerns that really so many times just don't need to be there. Um, the, um, at this time, will you provide to the members of this committee the names and the, um, the subjects and the venues of uh, all the individuals that you rely on to work out this, this issue? I will be glad to do that. I can tell you right now, summarily, there is the two academics at Harvard and Southern Cal, and there are the people here at Treasury with two others from my law firm, and that is it, about 15 people. But I will get you the information and, and, and uh, in transparency lay it out to you and let you have all that information. Thank you very much. And that is how we avoid all of the he says, she says, or we hear reports when we don't have it. Thank you very much. I would the gentleman you. yield? I yield to the gentleman from California. You know, uh, being an old employer, I, I couldn't resist asking one question. You have had more than half of the uh, key 25 of AIG and B of A depart. How many outside individuals under similar pay to the people that you are losing did you hire? In other words, not from within, not people that are already number 26 or number 28, but how many new outside people have entered the ranks of the top 25 of those two companies? under the conditions you are willing to pay? I don't, I don't know the answer to that, Congressman. It is a fair question and I will try and get you that if answer. If you would get back to us on that. Additionally, uh, Madam Chair, I would like to enter Bloomberg.com's article uh, into the record at this time Thanks. because it has been brought up. And then just ask one closing question, which is uh, if the uh, credit default swaps had, had not been paid at full value but at 60 cents on the dollar, which was a negotiated amount, wouldn't that amount that wouldn't have gone to oh, Goldman Sachs and other companies, wouldn't have that been greater than all of the executive compensation that you are going to handle over your tenure? Uh, I am not sure. but By, I, by, I, by a magnitude of many? I, I, I am not sure, but I will assume based on the ranking minority member's question that the answer is a definitive yes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. I yield back. Mr. Foster is recognized for five minutes. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Feinberg, for appearing today. I really appreciate it. Um, the first question I have is sort of technical. When you attempt to align compensation incentives with long-term company performance using stock that um, it has to be held over time or vests over time, do you encounter problems in preventing employees from simply hedging against a possible decline in the stock value? Prohibited by our rules and regulations. Very okay. good question. And who, who enforces this, especially for former employees that are holding the stock that is going to vest over time? I would guess with, with any of our um, final compensation determinations, if there is a violation, 
I would assume that that would be referred to the Department of Justice. Okay, but do they have to report? If you, if you leave the firm and then, um, you know, for the next several years you have to go and file some piece of paper that says, I have not taken a hedging position in some offshore derivative market that you I don't think, know about? I think we would monitor that and, and be required to do that, yes. Okay, so there, there are financial statements that have to be filed I think years, so. after your, years after you're terminated. Okay, and your staff is at least not shaking their head. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, so now I may get corrected okay. in the next hour, and if so, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay, thank you. Um, now, down the hall in the Financial Services Committee that I also serve on, um, we have sort of a broader um, concerns about the compensation structures for systemically important firms and not just TARP recipients. So based on your experience in dealing with the corporate culture and so on, um, I was wondering if I could have your reaction, if writing, if you're not comfortable doing it now, to two possible um, uh, structural changes in compensation that might help um, in, in going forward in, in, in systemically important firms. The first one is the requirement of periodic stress tests for systemically important firms with negative implications for executive compensation in the case that the stress test didn't come out well. So that if you're seen to be operating a company that will not withstand a 20 percent decline in asset values or whatever the stress test would be based on, that actually that would have a negative implication for the bonuses this year. So that's suggestion one. Um, suggestion two um, is that, as you probably are aware, the administration or the Treasury and the Financial Services Committee staff jointly proposed uh, industry-wide assessment into an FDIC-like insurance fund and it would be post-funded so that um, this would be after, you know, if a too-big-to-fail firm failed, um, the whole industry or at least firms above, I believe, 10 billion in assets get, get effectively have to pay into this fund to cover the losses. Um, and I was wondering if you have a reaction or could provide one against making that assessment not only against the firms themselves but against the highly compensated individuals um, and perhaps even using a clawback provision. Again, those are uh, questions. I will get back to you. Th those corporate governance questions um, are very important. They are all part of the total determination of what constitutes credible compensation. Um, to the extent that over the next few months we are dealing with in designing compensation structures for employees 26 to 100, which is on my watch. It is, it is suggestions such as yours, um, Congressman, that, that you know, we should take a look at. I don't know if it should be part of my report or be part of the broader corporate governance reform effort that's underway, but clearly uh, those are um, suggestions. Uh, that, that ought to be considered, yes. Yeah, so um, what I'm looking for is a response of you personally, not as, a, as special master, because you have been on the front lines of this. You've dealt with the corporate culture. You've seen what makes people jump and what makes them shrug, and that's what we have to understand. I, I will uh, honor your request and get back to you then as right. a layman, as a private citizen. Thanks very much. And Thank I you. yield back. Thank you. Um, Mr. Uh, Jordan from Ohio. Thank the, the, the chair, and I, uh, I apologize. I was over on the floor doing handling a few suspensions for this committee. Good so job, if I ask yeah. some things that have already been asked, you know, bear with me if you would, um, Mr. Feinberg. We appreciate you being here and your and your uh, staff as well. Um, was there any coordination? I mean, you, you in, in some of your responses to uh, Congressman Bilbray, uh, you talked about the independence of your place. Was was there any coordination when last week then when your findings came out along with what the Fed is planning to do? And as I read what the Fed's planning to do, I mean, I think about. Security National Bank in Urbana, Ohio. It looks like they, they, you know, the president there could be, in fact, potentially uh, having the government look at, at his his or her compensation. So, uh, was there any coordination, or is it just the luck of the, the the way the world works that they happen to come out the same day? We we have been co it was the luck that it came out the same day. Frankly, right. we have coordinated with the Federal Reserve in terms of keeping each other apprised of what I'm doing. We had no input that I'm aware of, none in terms of what the Federal Reserve uh, released last week in terms of the content of, of its prescriptions. So not relative to content, but relative to timing there was no. No. As, as a matter of fact, we did not. I had no contact with the Federal Reserve concerning the timing of their release. Complete no. coincidence that those two, they, they came out the same day. Um, all I can tell you, Congressman, is that um, um, uh, th there was no coordination okay. and no um, right. communication in that right. regard. Do, do you... Um, uh, kind of some, again, sort of picking up where Congressman Bilbray was uh, in the in the big picture sense. Are you troubled 
you know, you think about cars are, pays are, TARP program, energies are, stimulus package, bailouts for the auto industry. Are, are you, as you look back, uh, and you can probably guess where I come from, do you think we might have been a little better off if we would have never started down this road in the first place? I'm not going to second guess Congress. I've learned over the years that's a mistake. The American people uh, sure do, and I, I sure I, do. I, I can only say, uh, Congressman, as I've said it publicly, that my, my role is relatively very, very limited. It is the seven companies that are owned by the American people that I'm focused on, and that is all I'm Let focused on. Let me ask on. you this, Mr. Feinberg, then, are you, uh, the slippery slope argument, are you, are you nervous, in light of comments by people like Senator Schumer, who has talked about expanding this to any publicly traded company, um, you know, I, I guess I just look at this and I'm thinking, who would have thought in the United States of America we would have the federal government, the special master of executive compensation, telling a private American citizen what they could make. I mean, th sometimes if you step back and, and ask the fundamental question, I think you, you stop and think, wow, this is amazing where we are at today in the United States of America. And that's a concern. And it's also a concern that when you think about it, you know, we're a country of over 300 million people. And we have this huge market. We're the largest economy in the world. And now one person one single person is deciding what people make is i mean to me that is that is that's a dangerous dangerous place we're going and then when you couple it with again what senator schumer has said where this potentially can take us as a nation it's no wonder americans are frightened and frankly some members of congress are pretty scared too where we're headed i have two answers to your concern one my job and my office and what I'm doing was established by Congress in a federal statute accompanied by official tre Treasury regulations. I'm, not, uh, I I'm serving under the law, and I'm, I'm obligated to serve under the law. Mr. Mr. Feinberg, I understand that. And, and, you know, I get it. And I get the fact that these, these companies, these firms held out their money and took, took the taxpayer dollar. I get that. My question is, does it trouble you as the person who has that responsibility where it could potentially lead and the, the implications of taking this step when you already have members of Congress, frankly important members, influential members like Senator Schumer talking about where it goes next? I am troubled, uh, and I say so in my public statement, I am troubled at the notion that my role currently with these seven companies uh, I am troubled at the notion that it might that that it could be expanded. Well, it's important that, that is you, a mistake. It's important that you emphasize what you said earlier. It stops here, because I mean, that's what scares people. And and I think that God bless you for saying it, but it's important that you, you that you stick to it. Now let me ask you one quick question. I have a couple seconds left. Um, it seems to me that that the administration is going to great lengths to keep you. You know that you know you met with the Treasury Secretary a couple times. You don't meet with the with the, with the Obama administration. So. Tell me about that. Tell me the relationship you have with uh, Treasury Secretary Geithner. I have an excellent relationship not only with the Secretary of the Treasury, I'd like to think, but with, the, with other officials at Treasury and at the Federal Reserve in terms of consulting with them concerning these decisions that I'm making, suggestions that I'm making. They have been extremely cooperative in offering their advice to me at my request. Ultimately, the decision's mine, but I have sought out a wide range of views. The academics that I mentioned earlier that are our consultants, uh, individuals at Treasury, individuals at the Federal Reserve, in an effort to come up with a report that I think is balanced, that is fair, and most importantly, complies with the statute and the regulations. Thank you, Thank you. Chair. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Dr. Chu. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Fitz. Mr. Feinberg for um, testifying before us today. I know you have the limited purview of these seven companies, but uh, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Chase and Morgan Stanley, of course, had substantial loans. They paid it, paid it off since, and they are no longer under executive pay restrictions. However, uh, with their profits recovering from the government bailouts, all three firms are expected to make huge payments to their executives this year. And in fact, um, according to Attorney General Cuomo, Goldman earned $2.3 billion in 2008, yet paid out more than twice that amount, $4.8 billion in bonuses. 
What authority would it take to stop such negligent and uh, reckless behavior? What could we do to stop this? This is well, very the, upsetting to the American people, as you know. That, that, that is a, a huge legitimate question. What authority? Uh, uh, tr historically, the authority has been the self-regulating marketplace. Now, to the extent that um, that's supplemented by the Federal Reserve, by the regulators like the SEC, the FDIC, um, that is a subject that Congress may want to revisit. I, I want to emphasize my reluctance to attempt in any way to broaden my jurisdiction beyond these seven companies where I'm trying to collect money representing the taxpayers as a creditor. I'm not saying it's not a legitimate concern. I'm just saying that um, it, it's a subject that goes well beyond my jurisdiction, it seems to me. Well, uh, there is one company, GMAC, which is um, under your jurisdiction, and it has already received $12.5 billion of TARP money. However, uh, they are asking for a third bailout. And how do you plan to ensure that the additional $5.6 billion that they're requesting doesn't go towards these unscrupulous compensation practices? Um, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are very vigilant in making sure that the compensation practices that we have articulated in this report um, are fair, are reasonable, and um, will be paid by GMAC to its employees as part of this program. I'm not sure where that extra requested funding will go, but we want to make sure under the law that there's sufficient funds at GMAC to pay uh, these officials, and we'll, we'll make sure of that. And for them to control their compensation practices? They control their compensation practices subject to our rules and regulations in which we ha have mandatory jurisdiction, Congresswoman, to make sure that we're monitoring that, that comp those compensation practices. Uh, well, let's, let's talk about AIG. I know that you made some major exceptions to pay, to pay cuts for three senior AIG executives who had signed contracts for multi-million dollar bonuses prior to your appointment. You stated that you're, you're reluctant to invalidate contracts prior to the ena enactment of this current law. But do you have the authority to override these contractual rights? What can be done about this, this situation? You have AIG um, employees who, well, let's see, four employees made over $4 million. One employee made $10.5 million. We, we have authority under the law to, to attempt to work with the company in renegotiating those contracts. We have been successful in almost every case, although that's the exception that you have referenced, three individuals at AIG. What we did with those three individuals at AIG, they had a contract, they insisted on um, honoring that contract, they had every right to insist on honoring that contract, and therefore, under the law, I took those contracts into account in reducing their 2009 compensation. Beyond that, I had no authority to act, and I think that, uh, uh, that that's what I did under those circumstances. Okay, um, well, there are alarming findings that executive compensation is actually increasing, even though there is this outrage by, by Americans. Um, now that you've had the experience with these seven companies, what would be your rec recommendation on a going forward basis? I think going forward we will continue, first, to implement the recommendations in our report that call for a reduction in cash compensation of around 90% a reduction in overall compensation of around 50 percent cash plus stock. In addition, I am hoping, uh, and we've also reined in perks, we've also tied compensation to longer term performance, and I'm hoping that our recommendations will be followed not only by these seven companies which are required to follow them, but I'm hoping that some of our recommendations will voluntarily be adopted by other companies seeking to improve their compensation practices. We shall see. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Time has expired. Mr. Cummings is recognized for five minutes to be followed by Mr. Connolly.
Mr. Feinberg, I want to thank you for your testimony. And I've listened to you very, very carefully. And I do believe that you have done what you've been instructed to do. I, 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 and I think you've done an outstanding job. Thank you. Let me just try to get down to where the rubber, rubber meets the road. You know, I think part of the reason why this is going on, why you're doing what you're doing, what, why the Congress asked you to do what you're doing, is so that, and you've implied this in your testimony, part of the reason is to try to get other companies to do this beyond the seven. And I have had an opportunity, I know you got maximum cooperation, I think you said, uh, with AIG. And I've had an opportunity to meet with the former head of AIG, Mr. Liddy, and to listen quite a bit to what he had to say. And I read the papers just like you do. I have absolutely no confidence, none, that the things that you're able to do, and it has nothing to do with you, there is a culture on Wall Street that will cause them to reduce salaries. I mean, consistent with what you just said a minute ago. And I mean, in your, in your, I mean, and, and you're a very bright and straightforward person. I mean, what do you see, what, I mean, what would cause them to even do it? Because my dealings with them is like, we're on two different planets. They have, I think that when they talk about multi-million dollar bonuses, it's like shoe shine money to them, and I'm serious. And so, and they, when you talk to, well, I talked to Mr. Liddy about my constituents who are being thrown out of their houses because of foreclosure, losing their savings, everything, and they still, they still wanted to give money to the financial products division, and to not, to seem to not even have a clue, or not give a hoot about these folks and at the same time handing out millions. I mean, it, I, I just can't see how with all your fine work that is going to be turned around. I just don't. I mean, I, I've been around a long time. <laughs> and number two, I was wondering what advice do you have conversations with the president? And because let me tell you, I believe that the American people, in order for, for, in order for um, all of the things that the President is trying to do to right this economic ship, if the American people aren't there, and if they feel like they're getting screwed every which way, and certainly it goes beyond these seven companies, and you know, so the question becomes, are we, um, I mean, what do we see? What do you see? And don't forget, I mean, I know what you're hoping. But Mr. Borowski said something the other day that really impressed me when he was giving us a, giving us a little uh, talk about his report. He said that, that, that Secretary Geithner and others, whenever he's, he comes before us, they listen. So here you are before us, you're the man with the seven companies. I'm trying to figure out what will it take, if anything, this might be a culture that's impossible to turn around, to make these folks move in another direction. Congressman, you're asking a, a, a political science question about the difference, the gap, the gap between Wall Street and Main Street thinking on this subject. Um, I, A, I can play whatever role I can play, hopefully, in impressing upon Wall Street generally the value of what's in this report. Whether or not Wall Street will pick up on any of this, I do not know. And give me your best argument. That's what I want to hear. You're talking to Wall Street. You said, Wall Street, we've got a great report here. This is why you should do this. Your best argument. My best argument would be to Wall Street that this is why you should do this, because if you don't do this, there may be a time when, when Congress or others will rein, in, uh, will rein in pay and will limit your discretion. 
and will limit your unilateral ability to determine what to pay people. I mean, to the extent that these modest proposals, modest in the sense that they only apply to seven companies, to the extent that they are ignored in the private marketplace, ignored, well, I mean, the question is, will Congress, in its wisdom, um, sit by? and allow compensation to go forward under the old regime and the old way of doing things. I don't know. I, I've got enough problems, as you've witnessed this morning, dealing with these seven companies and, and um, um, suggesting that my role should definitely not go beyond these seven companies uh, to um, express a view on what global decisions should be made by Congress to try and rein in Wall Street. That is a subject of uh, uh, beyond my, my jurisdiction and one that uh, I wisely don't want to get near because I don't want to undercut my credibility and my effectiveness in terms of dealing with these seven companies. Thank you very much, we, Chairman. We, we might need another master to do that. <laughs> Congressman Conley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Feinberg, thank you for your willingness to serve. Um, you know, in listening to some of the rhetoric about this subject, on the other side of the aisle, one, one, one would think, if one knew nothing, that uh, Congress and the federal government just have this irrational compulsion uh, to interfere in the private sector and arbitrarily set compensation limits. Well, what's your understanding of why your job was created, Mr. Feinberg? My job was, it, it's clear, my job was created by Congress and the Treasury to establish compensation determinations designed with one primary objective in mind, to get the taxpayer's money back. And that is the primary objective. Now, how we do that... Mr. Feinberg, uh, I understand that, uh, and thank you. Uh, but why? Was something, did something go wrong? Why, why did we decide on these seven companies? These are the seven companies that were, that were uh, allowed, uh, I guess, to survive uh, on the back of the taxpayer's willingness to contribute ah, these funds. So the private sector, the free market, in fact, had failed. Is that correct? Correct. Let's take one of the seven companies you oversee, AIG. The, lar the largest corporate quarterly loss in American history was in the last quarter of last calendar year, and it was none other than AIG. Is that correct? Correct. And AIG has the, been the biggest recipient of bailout funds? Is that correct? I think that's, yes, that's correct. So it had the largest loss and the largest single taxpayer bailout in American history. Is that correct? Correct. Does the public have any interest at all in wanting to see some kind of rational compensation limits in a company that is bailed out, the biggest in its history? Insofar as the public's view is reflected by the statute that I'm um, uh, working under, yes. Does that seem a rational concern on our part to you? No. You think it's not rational? Uh, I think it, it, it is. It's a rational response to the crisis. In yes. protecting the public's interest? Yes. Thank you. Um, let me ask you this question. One of the four broad mandates that Congress gave you in creating the statute that created the special master was to review prior payments. When your office reviewed prior payments to senior executives in AIG, what did you find? Uh, because presumably you found something wrong in the fact that you've chosen to roll back some of that compensation. With most of the companies, we found that prior to the enactment of the law, there had been prior payments actually made. There was nothing nefarious or illegal about it. Those were contracts that were entered into prior to the uh, enactment of the statute creating my office. What we did find going forward under my tenure, we did find that there were pending payments that were obligated to be made under prior contracts, and we were able, through negotiation with the companies, in almost every respect except two or three cited earlier, to get those contracts voluntarily um, invalidated. And instead, we rolled the amounts that were involved in those contracts into prospective performance-based stock. Ah performance-based. Yes. When you looked at compensation, prior compensation, and in your report you're submitting today looking forward, I assume that there's some rational basis
for your coming up with the recommendations you came up. For example, we've heard some rhetoric here today that would seem to suggest that the sky's the limit. We have no business even talking about limiting executive compensation, even in companies we've built out. Um, but, and you, you agreed that within some reason, any limit is arbitrary. I think that's right. I mean, but would you not agree, however, if I said uh, the CEO's compensation in Company X ought to be 200% of Company X's entire profit for the year, that would be an irrational compensation, would it not? I think it probably would. So, so it's not entirely arbitrary. Oh no, it's not. Our decision, our decisions weren't arbitrary. Our decisions absolutely were based, uh, I think, were based on a reasonable evaluation of the data and the anecdotal information we received from the institution, the seven companies. I would defend my report as being not at all arbitrary, but very, very principled, very rational, and very reasonable. Now, people may disagree, but I think it is clearly uh, a reasonable and defensible report that was submitted uh, to the Secretary. And you used the words performance-based. Could you just elaborate on that? Because that's where we get into the rational or arbitrary here. It's tied to some kind of rational expectation of per financial performance on the part of the company. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. We rejected out of hand the notion that regardless of company performance, there should be guaranteed salaries, guaranteed bonuses, guaranteed commissions, guaranteed perks, guaranteed, guaranteed, guaranteed. And what we said in our report, and what I recommended, is that the, the era of the compensation guarantee is over. And instead, other than small cash based salaries. The remainder of the compensation package should be tied to performance. And not only tied to company performance, but tied to company performance over a period of time so that you cannot simply short the stock, sell it after a year, roll it over. You've got to hold it for up to four years. And then we're hoping the long-term benefit of holding that stock will tie the official's compensation to the overall value of the company as reflected in the stock. In addition, one other point, we also offered up the notion of longer-term incentive-based stock in addition to salary. But that stock cannot be redeemed. It cannot be sold until and unless the taxpayers get their money back. That's the, the formula we tried to use to correct what we thought in our report uh, were the problems with executive compensation practices in these seven companies. I thank you, and yeah. my time is up, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <coughs> right. Thank you very much. I hear one minute from the gentleman. Oh, I appreciate the chairman. Yeah, I just want to make a point on my, my friend and colleague from Virginia. Um, they talked about the private sector failing. I think this is important to understand. Well, the private sector didn't fail. We had, we had some institutions that had some major problems, but to argue that the private sector failed is just, in my judgment, fundamentally wrong. Certain instit institutions fail in the private sector every single day in this country and across, this, across, across the planet. That's part of capitalism. That's part of what the problem is. Once we start down the road, that's when we get into all these questions and all these problems. Yeah, thank you very much. But let me just say this before I yield to the gentlewoman from New York, uh, that you know, there's a lot of concern about these folks who have failed going to another company. You know, I'm not sure that anybody would be too excited about hiring people that fail. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't think you have to worry about that too much. You know, they run one country in the ground, one company in the ground, and then you expect to get big money to go to another and do the same thing. So I, I don't know if that's a real concern. You know. Well, w we hear the argument all the time, and, and the argument goes, you know, you, you've, you've expressed one view, and, and ranking minority members expressed a view. You know, there are a lot of vacancies. The question is, those vacancies are now gone, and whoever was going to leave would have left. I don't know. We are trying to implement the statute, uh, keeping in mind both of those positions. It's a balancing act. 
You know, I think about members of Congress, and we think we're so great, but when we leave, somebody take our seat. <laughs> and they do real well. Uh, I yield now five minutes to the gentlewoman from uh, New York. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first, I'd uh, like to welcome Mr. Feinberg and uh, mention his truly outstanding work as a special master for 9-11 during a very uh, difficult period in our country with a very difficult topic. You did a very fine job. Um, I, I'd like to ask how we are faring internationally in terms of our compensation compared to foreign countries. We are in a global market now. We are competing with uh, firms across the world. And, and how does uh, U.S. executive pay compare to, say, pay in Japan and in European countries? I'm not, I, I can get you that data, Congressman. I can tell you that what I do know is that there's been a great deal of recent G20 and other cooperation between Treasury and the Secretary and other companies in, in, and other countries in trying to come up with a common set of international standards governing compensation. How, how much American compensation varies from Japan or Germany or Italy, I don't know, but I can certainly get you that data. I, I'd like to, to know, and uh, I, I also have read that the United Kingdom um, adopted say and pay rules uh, or shareholder vote on executive pay, and uh, are you aware of that? And has that made any difference in, in pay scale, or have you followed what's happened in the United I, Kingdom? Again, I think that's of recent vintage. I will again try and uh, secure some information concerning the impact of that uh, in the United Kingdom. And uh, the United Kingdom's uh, five largest banks have reportedly agreed to abide by the G20 executive compensation rules. And have U.S. banks uh, likewise agreed to accept these uh, conditions, and which include an independent compensation committee and clawbacks for poor for for, for poor performance? Uh, not on my watch. I don't know. Uh, I'm limited to these seven companies, uh, and again, at the risk of um, um, disappointing you, I will uh, get you answers to these questions, Congressman. And um, do you? Are you aware of any other legislative fixes or actions that we should be taking in, in terms of uh, tying executive pay more to performance? Well, that, that raises the whole question that I've discussed earlier about corporate governance and, and, and what Congress is considering, as I understand it, in both the House and the Senate, concerning both corporate governance reforms in federal legislation and um, uh, corporate um, uh, regulatory reform. And both of those uh, subjects certainly are part of the overall concern about total compensation, even though those two subjects aren't directly part of my jurisdiction. Okay. The, the law gives the firms the right to appeal within 30 days of the compensation determination. And, and do you anticipate appeals? And if so, how will they be conducted? I haven't received any appeals as yet. Um, I'm hopeful there won't be any appeals. If there are under the law, we will certainly give due consideration to those appeals. But as of yet, uh, as of today, uh, Congresswoman, we don't have any appeals. Okay. And, and the New York Times reported that Citigroup, as well as other banks, continue to offer grant guaranteed bonuses to employees. And, and does that uh, violate the Treasury regulations? It all depends whether those employees that are getting those grants, allegedly in the New York Times, fall within my jurisdiction of 1 to 25 or 26 to 100. Um, Citigroup and other companies under my jurisdiction uh, at least legally have the authority to um, um, act independently if they are not part of my mandatory jurisdiction. Now, I could, under the law, issue some advisory opinion. Uh, uh, if I knew more about uh, such, such uh, bonuses, and we'll, we will look into that. Um, do you have the authority to override contractual rights? No. If the contractual rights are found by my office to be valid, legal, and binding, then we, we give due deference to the Constitution and the fact that the sanctity of contract should be, recommend, should be upheld. But, as I said earlier, we do have under the law two ways 
to deal with these old contracts that might be found to be valid. One, we can seek to renegotiate those contracts with the company. We have been very successful in doing that and getting the company to voluntarily yield on those contracts and roll it over into performance-based stock. Second, if a company refuses to um, voluntarily modify the contract, we can take those contracts into account in establishing prospective compensation. So we do have some weapons at our disposal. Thank you. My time has expired. We've been called to a vote, and thank you again for your service to our nation. Thank you again, and Congressman, thank you for all your help on 9-11. Uh, you were a stalwart in convincing your constituents to come into the fund, and I will always be in your debt for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let me thank you for your testimony. You were an outstanding witness, no question about it. And we want to let you know we appreciate that, appreciate the work that you've done, and uh, we really, really want to continue to stay in touch with you as we move forward because, as I indicated early on in my opening statement, the American people are angry. And, of course, you're helping to sort of calm them down. Thank you so much. Mr. Chairman, you and the ranking minority member need only call, and I will be up here as soon as possible. Thank, Thank you, you all very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now our second panel. I think your audience is going to disappear now. <laughs> well, with your staff leaving, there's plenty of open seats. <laughs> Thank you. second panel of two witnesses, Professor Black and Professor Roberts. As with the first panel, it is committee's policy that all witnesses are sworn in, so please stand and raise your right hand as I administer the oath. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. Let the record reflect that the witnesses has answered in the affirmative. Affirmative. <clears throat> William K. Black is an associate professor of economics and law at the University of Missouri, uh, Kansas City. An author of the book, The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One. Of course, uh, we welcome you to the committee. Uh, Russell Roberts is a professor of economics at George Mason University and a research scholar at Stanford University, Hoover Institution. Welcome. Your entire state minute will be placed in the record, and I'd like to ask you if you would assume in this, the time and what the clock does, it starts out, it's on green, then it goes to yellow, and then it turns red. So we'd like for you to do it within five minutes, and then we might have to stop you because the fact that we have votes on the floor and uh, but we want to get as far as we can uh, before. So thank you very much. And why don't we start with you, uh, Mr. Roberts. Yeah, you can begin. You may want to pull it a little closer, too. Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, and distinguished members of the committee, Americans are angry about executive compensation, rightfully so. The executives at General Motors and Chrysler don't deserve to make a lot of money. They made bad products that people didn't want to buy. The executives on Wall Street don't deserve to make a lot of money. They were reckless. They borrowed huge sums to make bets that didn't pay off, and they wasted trillions of dollars of precious capital, funneling it into housing instead of health innovation or high mileage cars or a thousand investments more productive than more and bigger houses. Everyday folks who are out of work through no fault of their own want to know why people who made bad decisions not only have a job, but a big salary to go with it. No wonder they're angry at Wall Street. But if we keep getting angry at Wall Street, we'll miss the real source of the problem. It's right here in Washington. We are what we do, not what we wish to be, not what we say we are, but what we do. And what we do here in Washington is rescue large companies, large financial institutions, and rich people from the consequences of their mistakes. When mistakes don't cost you anything, you do more of them. When your teenager drives drunk and wrecks the car, you keep giving him a do-over, repairing the car and handing him back the keys, he's going to keep driving drunk. 
Washington keeps giving bad banks and Wall Street firms a do-over. Here are the keys. Keep driving. The story always ends with a crash. Capitalism is a profit and loss system. The profits encourage risk-taking. The losses encourage prudence. It is, is it a surprise that when the government takes the losses instead of investors, that investing gets less prudent? If you always bail out lenders, is it surprising that firms can borrow enormous amounts of money living on the edge of insolvency? I'm mad at Wall Street, but I'm a lot madder at the people who gave them the keys to drive our economy off a cliff. I'm mad at the people who have taken hundreds of billions of dollars of taxpayer money and given it to some of the richest people in human history. I'm mad at President Bush, President Obama, Secretary Paulson, Secretary Geithner, and Chairman Bernanke. And I'm mad at Congress. You helped risk takers continue to expect that the rules that apply to the rest of us don't apply to people with the right connections. You've saved the system, but it is not a system worth saving. It's not capitalism. It is crony capitalism. Using a special master for compensation to get our money back is too little too late. Many people argue that because the government handed out the money, the government has a right to dictate how it's spent. But in a constitutional democracy like ours, it's not the government that has rights. We, the people, have rights. The Constitution exists to restrain government, not to, empowerment, not to empower it. Whether government has the right to limit pay is not the question. The question is whether it's a good idea for the government to have the power to set compensation. And despite our anger, the answer is no. Hayek, the Nobel laureate economist, said, the curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. The special master imagines he can design compensation packages that align incentives while retaining key talent. But it is impossible for any one person, no matter how wise, to anticipate the consequences of such decisions. Nor does he have any incentive to acquire that knowledge. He has no skin in the game. A single individual has been given enormous arbitrary power with insufficient accountability or transparency. This is not good for the rule of law, democracy, or capitalism. By focusing on those who owe the government TARP money, the special master distracts us from other firms that benefited from government rescue, such as Gold Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase. The comfort we receive from seeing competition, compensation reduced distracts us from the policies that created the problem in the first place, the rescue of Wall Street from its own recklessness. It is a charade, a political window dressing to make crony capitalism look respectable. I want my country back. Let's get the government out of the auto business, out of the banking business, out of the compensation design business. We need explicit timetables to disengage from government ownership, including a plan for how the Federal Reserve will draw down its balance sheet. Most of all, we need to stop trying to imagine we can design housing markets, mortgage markets, financial markets, and compensation. I want my country back. I want a country where responsibility still means something, where rich and poor, Main Street and Wall Street live by the same rules. We don't need a special master to level the playing field. We just need to take the crony out of crony capitalism so we can get back to the real thing. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very, very, very much. Uh, Professor Black. I join Russ in thanking you all for having us, uh, making this opportunity. And I would certainly agree with him strongly that what we have is crony capitalism. But it isn't crony capitalism that occurs simply because of bailouts, and that's critical to understand. This same process occurred when creditors were wiped out, when subordinated debt holders were wiped out, when shareholders were wiped out. It happened when there were absolutely no bailouts in Enron, in WorldCom, in all of these circumstances. And it was the same mechanism, executive compensation, that drove those frauds. It is what is producing the crony capitalism. And you can stop the bailouts, and I think you should, but you're still going to have this problem unless you deal with pay. And you have to deal with not simply executive compensation, you have to deal with compensation more broadly. So look what happened. In the savings and loan crisis, there was an exhaustive investigation of what happened, and the National Commission found that in the typical 
large failure, fraud was invariably present, and that the means of the fraud was accounting fraud, and that the way you convert the firm assets to the benefit of the CEO is through modern compensation mechanisms. You saw that in abundance with Enron and WorldCom, the use of the rank and yank system to incent people to commit frauds. In other words, we have known for at least 35 years how to do incentives. And it came not from government, but from a very conservative libertarian, Michael Jensen who said, we're doing it all wrong, we need to change compensation, we need to go to much more aggressive performance-based pay. And he set out how you should do it. And what did Mr. Feinberg just report? That 35 years later, even after these disastrous failures, they couldn't get it right. That they designed systems and tried to run it past him, which obviously further misaligned the interests of shareholders from those of the managers. Right? So we need to stop that system. That is the system that has caused this crisis. Why did loan brokers bring in bad loans consistently? Because they were put on incentive systems based solely on volume and not on quality. Why did appraisers get inflated? It's because compensation created a Gresham's dynamic in which bad ethics drove good ethics out of the marketplace. And there are really good quantitative numbers on this. Professor Black, we're going to have to interrupt you. We have to run the vote, but we'll be back in 10 minutes after the last vote, okay? So sure. we'll we just do a recess. And, uh Apologize, uh, Professor Black. Uh, we thought we would be able to get your testimony uh, finished, but the point is that we ran out of time. You know, you have to vote around here, and if you don't vote, you know, your constituents will talk about it. You know, we talk about anger. You know, that's the uh, same kind of anger we get with this compensation uh, if you don't vote. So uh, we had to run over to uh, make the vote. So if you would continue, please. Okay. Turn your mic on. <laughs> All right. Uh, to resume, the critical thing to understand about accounting control fraud in connection with executive compensation is that it is a sure thing. It's a very simple formula for how you optimize. You grow really rapidly. You make very, very bad loans you have extreme leverage, and you put minimal loss reserves. If you do those four things, you will produce not just profits, but record profits. And then you can use seemingly normal corporate mechanisms of compensation to convert firm assets to your benefit as the CEO. It is the perfect crime. If you do it without giving orders, to engage in the accounting fraud. And you can give that order through modern executive compensation. I can't send a memo at Fannie Mae that says to 10,000 employees, we want to commit accounting fraud. But I can do the same thing with my compensation system. All I have to do is extend it, not just to the top 100. These modern compensation systems go f much farther down in the organization. And you will get, as a relatively junior officer, an incredible increase in your income. And as a more senior officer, of course, even more. And all you have to do is fudge the numbers. And then all I have to do as the CEO is not care and pay you a maximum bonus based on those fudge numbers. And the degree of this fudging is extraordinary. IndyMac losses on Alt-A, liar's loans, are running roughly 80%, it appears. 
OTS, the Office of Thrift Supervision, reports overall Alt-A loans are causing losses of 55 percent. Those are staggering numbers. The FBI has publicly testified that it would be irresponsible to discuss the current crisis without discussing the role of fraud in it. So no, compensation isn't what directly causes the largest losses. Compensation incents you to make deliberately bad loans to grow very rapidly to produce financial bubbles. That produces catastrophic losses. And that is the system that we have right now. I don't know where I am in terms of time, really. I think I've probably done five minutes, and I'll stop. You no, know, the day is not young. Thank you very much. Let me thank both of you for your, your, your testimony. And again, I apologize for the, uh, the break of the inter interruption that we had. Um, but uh, let me begin with you, um, uh, uh, Prof Professor Black. Uh, please explain the relationship between what you term accounting control fraud, uh, of course, and excessive executive compensation. This exists in both the criminology literature and the economics literature, and indeed we work together on it. Uh, the most famous piece is by the Nobel Prize winner George Akerlof and Paul Romer, uh, then at Berkeley, now at Stanford. And they have an article in 1993 entitled Looting, Bankruptcy for Profit. And this is how it works. I gave you the optimization condition. You grow really rapidly. You make deliberately very bad loans. You have extreme leverage, and you don't put on loss reserves. If you do those things, it must be the case that you will report record earnings. That was true in the savings and loan crisis, where Lincoln Savings and Vernon's, the two worst control frauds <coughs> in America, reported at different time periods, obviously, that they were the most profitable savings and loans in America. By the way, as a footnote, this also screws up any econometric analysis. It produces per uh, perverse results. All right, so now we have record income. Directly, of course, under modern executive compensation, which is extremely large and heavily oriented towards short-term accounting gains, this produces maximum bonuses. Frank Raines, in the context of Fannie Mae, when he was still running it, was asked by Business Week, why do we have all these frauds, referring to the Enron and WorldCom frauds, and he said it's because of modern executive compensation, that when you put enough money in front of people, good people will do bad things. The exact quotation is in my testimony, but that last line is, I think, word for word. Mm -hmm. Thank you um, very, very much, um, Professor Black. Um, Professor Roberts, I understand your aversion uh, to the bailout, but given the existing relationship between the government and the seven largest bailout firms, how would you address executive compensation issues until such time as the government has been repaid uh, and, and been able to get out of these, the companies? Well, Special Master Feinberg, I thought, did a masterful job defending what he's doing in those seven firms. And he is, as he said, helped by consultants, uh, Lucien Bebchuk and Kevin Murphy, two economists I have a lot of respect for. But unfortunately, there is no way that they can successfully figure out the consequences of their decisions, the mix of short-term and long-term pay. Special Master talked about it like it's a science. It's not a science. It's really a wild guess. And I think the real danger of his enterprise, besides the violation of the rule of law, the arbitrariness, the non-transparency, the lack of accountability, the biggest problem is that it distracts the American people 
It makes them feel good. Oh, we're, we're taking care of these, these seven firms. But what it does is it distracts people from the real cause of the crisis and the real reason they were so overcompensated, which is those government bailouts. So I think we ought to be focusing on the incentives that those bailouts created for egregious executive pay and, and outrageous uh, pay. And I think if we do that, we have a chance of preventing it from happening again in the future. If we stick with this system of trying to knock it down ex post in an ad hoc way, I'm worried we're going to miss the real lesson. You don't think that through this process that the folks on Wall Street will get the message? No, I don't think they will, actually. I don't think they'll get the message at all. I think we've got seven firms uh, being told uh, that they've got to behave. The rest of the firms are getting away with it. Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase, as some of the other members mentioned, they're making record profits. The reason they're making those record profits is with my money as a taxpayer because of the incentives we created for them, their expectation that they would get bailed out, that expectation came true and they acted profligately and irresponsibly. And I think the whole system needs to be fixed. The only way to fix it is not from the top down with these ad hoc uh, arbitrary decisions, but rather by taking away the very system that allowed them to thrive, which is the government rescue. That's what's created the expectation that created the current problem and it will create the next problem if we don't fix it. Right. What else do you think we need to do? Well, politically, since mm -hmm. there's a lot of anger on Main Street, I'd go after some folks that you have direct legislative control over. So I think it's a good time to get rid of some corporate welfare. It's a good time to get rid of uh, uh, payments to millionaire agribusiness folks. It's a good time to get rid of the sugar quota, which makes every American pay more for food, takes jobs out of uh, America into Canada where they don't have such sugar quotas. So politically, I think it's a great time to do some things that are often hard for di to do, and I'd love to see Congress do that. In terms of the financial crisis, I think we're going to have to have a recognition of government's role in the housing market is going to, I hope, will change. I hope we've learned something about the challenges and dangers of trying to create uh, home ownership for every American. That's not the American dream. It's the dream of the National Association of Home Builders and the National Association of Realtors. And uh, that's a bit of a mistake. Fannie and Freddie are going to cost us at least $100 billion. Uh, we've, you've budgeted $400 billion. I'm worried it's going to be more than that. The Federal Reserve holds a trillion or so dollars of their loans, many of which will turn out to be bad loans. So I'm worried about where that's going. So I would like to see, uh, if possible, Congress put some pressure on the Fed to get out of that business, get out of the mortgage business, which it's in now, have the federal government get out of the mortgage business. But most importantly, we've got to get out of the banking business. I don't want a, a banking system that's run implicitly or explicitly by Washington. It's not going to work. And it's just going to create the next set of problems like the ones we're in the middle of now. But we have to get our money back. Well, I'm worried about that, too, because, you know, I understand that urge. And a lot of people, politically, it's very important to get your money back. But I hate to say this, it might be a mistake to get the money back. Because it could be that by propping up these organizations in desperation to keep them going, we're going to cause other distortions, other problems, other waste that we don't see because we want our money back. You know, the special master is worried about losing key personnel. Well, maybe he ought to lose them. Maybe they ought to go do something else. Maybe these organizations ought to go out of business and let some other organization thrive. We're still funneling capital and scarce resources into them. We talked earlier about GMAC. GMAC wants another bailout. Maybe we ought to say, hey, enough. It's a mistake. We're not going to get our money back. I'm not going to keep throwing good money after bad because that's the risk that we're playing right now is we're going to continue to throw money at these folks. It's what we're doing with Freddie and Fannie. It's what we're doing with AIG. Maybe we ought to cut our losses and get out. So I understand the political pressure on you to get our money back, but maybe that's a bad risk. And to be honest, the special master has no incentive to care about that, whether that's a good decision or not. He's tasked with trying to get the money back. Again, I understand the advantages of that politically, but economically and for the citizens as a whole, that may be a mistake. My time has expired. I now yield to the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll start with Professor Roberts. Uh, ironically, the 1992 Act uh, felt that executives were not linked to enough risk. In other words, their pay was not at risk in those days, and it was going up. And so people's compensation was less linked to performance. And the law specifically, particularly taxing, double taxing, was designed to minimize 
the growth in the base pay and maximize the growth in risk win. Can you comment on, on, on in fact, what we should do differently if we want to see a change in that? Well, <clears throat> earlier I quoted uh, Friedrich Hayek, Nobel uh, laureate economics uh, economist, who talked about the purpose of economics to be to tell people that what they imagine they could design, they can't really design. And there's an inevitable tendency on the part of Congress, and everybody wants to do this, try to create the perfect system as if it's uh, like the engine of a car. Let, you know, we're going to tweak the carburetor over here. We're going to add some more uh, oxygen and gasoline and this a mix of this. And uh, it's a bit of a fantasy to think that, again, the wisest people in the world could tinker and fine tune the mix of current and future compensation to get the right level of risk taking, especially if in the background you have the feeling and the expectation, and it turns out to be true, that if you mess up, someone's going to rescue you and bail you out. In particular, the bailing out of lenders to those folks is what's really dangerous, and that's what we've done yeah. over and over again. Well, thank you for answering my question and describing the Fed. Uh, the, uh, Professor Black, well, come on, that's what they do, is they sit there saying, we can tinker with the economy and there will be no recession, there will be no inflation, everything will be perfect uh, until it isn't. Professor Black, uh, you talked about Franklin Raines. Now, we have a special regard for Franklin Raines here at the dais. Uh, what part of the, the catastrophe that the world felt do you put on Freddie and Fannie taking on knowingly, willingly, and in fact demanding to take on trillions of dollars of loans which had no underlying net value? Uh, in other words, they had no equity, no skin in the game by the, uh, the individuals, and thus no skin in the game for the banks once they got them onto Freddie and Fannie or countrywide. Uh, you know, because we're talking executive compensation, you're complaining about it, but in a sense, wasn't a great deal of this growth in financial communities uh, profit at the expense of the taxpayers from day one because we were taking these risky investments deliberately onto the federal payroll or federal uh, uh, balance book? Uh, no. Uh, it's actually a more complicated story. Well, wait a second. I appreciate the more complicated, but no deserves an explanation. That, no, Freddie and Fannie, did, the GSEs did not take subprime onto their books? Fannie and Freddie took less of it onto their books than did private, purely private entities. Well, let's, 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 but let's go through that. Freddie and Fannie took trillions onto the books, right? No. 1.9 trillion? Of subprime? Of subprime? No. What figure do you have? For subprime, they have very little, actually, uh, relatively speaking, they have relatively little subprime. They have much more of Alt A. Alt A makes subprime. You know, you're talking about liars loans. Uh, okay. You may be under the impression I'm here to defend Fannie and Freddie. Okay, but, but I let, assure you. But let's go through it. I am very different position. But, let, than but that. let's let's go through it. If you take AIG's FP division providing AAA rating for products that were subprime, you take Freddie and Fannie taking on subprime and Alt A. And you're right about one thing: Alt A is the other name for that basket of of loans which did not have ordinary income ratios and, uh, and equity. The fact is the banks that took that and flipped it did very well and their, uh, their executives deserved all that great pay because they managed to make money with no risk if they got it off their books. Isn't that right? In general, no. In general, these things were sold with recourse uh, putbacks. And one of the interesting- Until you bought a credit default and then you, 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 you wrapper insured uh, the failure. Perhaps you did. We don't know about the credit default uh, swap market, you have to understand. That okay. market is still almost completely opaque. Okay. Professor Roberts, perhaps you've got more transparency in this particular area if you don't mind answering the same question. question is what, uh, what about Fannie and Freddie's involvement? Uh, as you point out, I think one of the And Franklin Raines, who was compensated incredibly well for- $90 million over a six-year period. Uh, I had to give some of that back with an accounting fraud problem in 2004, but he did very well, and um, that's, that's the facts. Um, as you point out, subprime is an elusive, sub, uh, elusive definition. 
the way it should be defined is troubled loans, right? Which could be for many reasons. Uh, the most interesting, I think, statistic that I know of of Fannie and Freddie is that in 2007, at the height of the, the beginning of the collapse, when almost everybody started to realize this was going to have trouble, 23% of Fannie and Freddie's home purchase loans that they purchased, that is loans they purchased that were used to buy a house, 23% had less than 5% down. Again, they were still 23%, one in every five loans, that, four loans they were buying had very little skin in the game. Those loans, I think, right now are on the books of the Fed. I don't think they're going to turn out very well when they reset. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank I, very I much. would only note that uh, uh, Chairman Kucinich had actually, was actually holding a hearing during that time in which those lines were still being put on, showing the, the destruction that was happening in Cleveland at the time and, and the foreclosure rate that was climbing. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. And I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses for participating today. Uh, to uh, Professor Black, um, you have stated that government regulation and prosecution are the only solutions that can prevent an issue like this from occurring again. Uh, we now see corporations going, going so far as to sell derivatives on life insurance policies, uh, greatly increasing their risk. Uh, one can easily see the slippery slope at work here. Corporations will risk more, assuming that taxpayer dollars will be used to save them once again. Um, you have referred to the need for effective regulators. In your view, what jurisdictional power would these regulators have? Well, we should be regulating the financial lenders of America, not regulating the loan brokers, mortgage bankers, was a di disastrous uh, policy. Uh, my counterpart talked about how you can screw up regulation. That's quite true. That's why we don't do it that way. Right? Let me tell you what we did and why it was so effective in dealing with subprime crisis, the non-subprime crisis of 2001, 2002. Uh, I'm sorry, of 1991-1992. We didn't try to adopt perfect rules. We looked in the industry for their best practices. And we didn't go all the way to the best practice. We said, what's the prudent lenders do? And we had rules that said, you have to act in accordance with prudent members of the industry. That worked phenomenally well. It stopped what would have been a subprime crisis in those years. But we deregulated and desupervised after that point and thought it was illegitimate, impossible to regulate. It isn't. But you don't do it by creating every dot and jot. Like, you know, that's uh, not the way good regulators do it. Professor Roberts, anything to add to that? Yeah. Um, there's always the hope that this time will be different. Um, when we find ourselves back in the same place, you do start to think that maybe there's some fundamental mistake that we're making. I think there's a strong desire to see an improved regulatory system. We're going to get a different regulatory system, but the, question, the fundamental question is, is it going to be improved? Uh, the challenge is, is that Fannie and Freddie, to take an example, had their own regulator. Ofeo was had, explicitly had, they weren't distracted by anything. Why did Ofeo stand by and watch Fannie and Freddie make worse loans than they did before, increasingly risky loans, loans without documentation, zero down payment loans, loans with, for 103 percent of the value of the house? Why did they sit and do that and also stand by and catch an accounting fraud way too late after it had already been spiraling out of control? And the answer is politics, right? The people involved in the regulation got leaned on, partly by Congress, partly by Fannie and Freddie. Uh, as is well known, that we're caught in a vice, right? Congress wants Fannie and Freddie to be more active in, in getting loans to people who can't otherwise get a loan. It's a wonderful idea. Can't disagree with it. Everybody likes it. Fannie and Freddie want to make a lot of money, so they're all of a sudden pushing to take riskier loans. Everybody's happy until the taxpayer foots the bill. Now, the fundamental question is, why is the next regulatory system going to be insulated from that kind of political pressure? And the answer is, it won't be. And I would suggest we look for a different mechanism. And I would say again that as long as lenders 
And as long as financial institutions bailed out of their mistakes, this problem will happen over and over and over again. Now, and you, you left out Treasury and Federal Reserve. In which part? Uh, as far as OFEA. Oh, well, they're also involved, right? They were also involved in, in regulation, but I would even go further. We could go to, to Basel II, and Basel II's role in trying to regulate investment banks. Investment banks, think about how great this was. Basel II said, we got to have stiffer capital requirements to make sure that these investment banks are sufficiently capitalized so that they will not go broke. And we're going to make sure they're AAA, and we're going to give them more leverage if they're backed by housing because we know housing can't go down. That was a little bit of an error that helped not just create, but is a huge factor in this because it allowed banks to create, it gave the banks an incentive to create something that looked like AAA, which was not the toxic assets we're talking about. Going back to uh, uh, compensation, um, these regulations that you speak of, should they apply to compensation for all corporate employees or just executives? And I'd like to hear from both Professor Black and Professor Robbins. Well, you don't want to make the cutoff executive because they can define that in any way and, and get around to anything. Uh, I put a quotation in here, since we're talking about Fannie Mae, I was an expert witness for the government against Frank Raines, you do understand, uh, on these issues, uh, in which the complete internal audit system at Fannie Mae was destroyed by the compensation system. So if you leave it to private structures, we know empirically what they will do and that they have done for 35 years. They will systematically misalign the incentives to produce precisely this disaster, which again did not arise because of government bailouts. There were no government bailouts of Enron, WorldCom. There was no government bailout of Drexel Burnham Lambert, which was the big investment banking firm before this. Right? So under the theory we've heard, private market discipline should have been very effective because there were no bailouts. It was completely ineffective. It was completely ineffective this time again. Right? If you rely on private market discipline, you will be back here, and the only question is whether it's three years or five years from now, with a bigger disaster on your hands. Thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentlewoman from Ohio, Marcy. Capture. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Roberts, I'm here, Dr. Roberts, I'm hearing you say that regulation was the problem. Am I simplifying too much uh, not, your statement? Not so much regulation, but the anticipation of a bailout. And although. Yes. All right, anticipation of thank you. And if we go back to the 1980s when the SNLs were bailed out, that was a big green light. Yep. And they went and did more yep. and much worse and now bailed out again. Um, <clears throat> the question I have, you heard the testimony this morning, uh, and Dr. Black, you did as well. I want each of you to react <clears throat> to the special master's uh, uh, statements about two and four year bonuses re or stock uh, opportunities and whether you think that time period will really work to exert any restraint inside the system. But my big question to you really is, looking at the mess we have now, what do we do as a country to put the wheels back on this financial system? There's all kinds of proposals up here for um, uh, consumer credit agencies and um, uh, new powers for Treasury, uh, systemic risk councils and all of the rest. Cut through all of that. What do we need to do to restore a banking system to prudence in this country and to get our hands on the bank holding companies and all these other contortionists that turn themselves into something every time they get in trouble? What do we do? Well, I'd first What would you advise the President? What do you advise well, us? I put away the checkbook. That would be the first thing I'd advise, because I believe, uh, contrary to Professor Black, although we agree on a lot, I agree that the availability of that government checkbook is a huge driver of the irresponsibility that we've seen. 
I totally agree with you about the two to four year thing. I think that's a, a total, that's window dressing that gives the illusion that it's long term. First of all, four years is not long term. Second of all, three years into it, four years is not long term, right? And it's, they're going to have an incentive, unfortunately, and uh, it's happened in the past, to have the stock price go up and down a lot because when it goes down a lot, then you get your options at a low price. When it goes up a lot, you exercise them. Okay, so it takes a year and a year, and you get a, only get a third of them, or two years, you only get a third of them. It's still a bad incentive under the current system. Uh, one of the common things you hear is we need to recreate securitization, get back, get to the old model. People are scared of securitization. They should be. I'm scared of it. Look what it did to us. All right. And, and people say, we've got to recreate Fannie and Freddie. You know what the benefit of Fannie and Freddie was for the mortgage take person who took out a mortgage? A quarter of a percent. That's dwarfed by the hundreds of billions of dollars that we as taxpayers are going to be on the hook for. So I want more transparency. Let's not try to recreate what we've got but make it safer, which is a, 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 a mirage and an illusion. Let's be cautious. We should be cautious. We had a very bad experience. So my first lesson is don't try to recreate what we had before but safer. That's an illusion. <clears throat> Secondly, don't think you can arbitrarily steer this and that like the two to four year thing and think, oh, we solved the problem because we have the right incentives. Take away the checkbook so that people have to bear their losses. And my view is if we're back here in five years with the kind of crisis that Professor Black is worried about, I'll say, good riddance. You drove your company into the ground? Too bad. We're not going to bail you out. You lost your money. You took your chances. It's over. And people learn a lesson from it and will improve. The current system, there's no incentive for learning or improvement. It's a disaster. Dr. Black, thank you. Well, I certainly agree that the bailout is a disaster. Um, and I think you know, probably 98 percent of Americans believe that the bailout is a disaster. Uh, you're always going to hear from anybody who teaches economics and teaches criminology, you've got to change the incentive structure. The incentive structure is broken. It will produce recurrent, intensifying crises. It produces perfect crimes under this system. If you allow that to continue, the idea that we're going to have a cleansing every five years of a global crisis is not appealing to me, right? We can do better. We have done better. Now, if you appoint people to run agencies who do not believe in regulating, of course you'll have a disaster. There is an article by the FHA HUD person, very conservative, Hudson Institute, about Fannie and Freddie, who is in charge of monitoring the regulation of Fannie and Freddie. What does he say? It had nothing to do with incentives for housing. It is entirely driven by compensation and profit. Right? Very conservative gentleman in a position to know. The person running OFAO, I've met with the director as part of all this. This is a conservative, partisan Republican who hates regulation, right? Ofeo had perfectly adequate regulatory powers to stop Frank Raines and his successor, Mudd, who was every bit as bad, from doing what they did, which is going to cost America 200 plus billion dollars. And they did nothing because they didn't believe it was legitimate to regulate. I've met with these people. Right? It's, oh, I mean, we can't regulate a place, right? How could we affect compensation? That's their decisions. Now, maybe if the losses have actually occurred, then maybe we could act. Well, in the savings and loan crisis, because we recognized accounting fraud, we targeted Lincoln Savings while it was reporting it was the most profitable savings and loan in America. Can you imagine how different that is than the modern world? You talk about putting up with pressure. Charles Keating wrote, get black, kill him dead. He hired pr private detectives twice to investigate me. He sued me for $400 million in my individual capacity in a Bivens action. He got a majority of this house to co-sponsor a resolution calling on us not to go forward with re-regulation. He got the Speaker of the House, James Wright, Jr., to go after us. One of these proposed charges of the Ethics uh, Independent Council was the effort of James Wright to fire William K. Black. Right? And we got five senators that I blew the whistle on, the Keating Five. 
and we took it. And we re-regulated the industry and we stopped control frauds that were growing at an average of 50 percent a year and would have produced a crisis of this magnitude if it had been allowed to go on. Yes, you're right. The leadership is vital and we have to have a system in which we have real civil service, where we have a real Justice Department, your effort to get at least a thousand additional FBI agents assigned to deal with these frauds is absolutely critical. The Justice Department in terms of prosecutors needs help as well. We have to change the incentive structures. One way is through deterrence, it's Becker and the whole theory of uh, conservatives about how you deal with crime. But another way is to get rid of the perverse incentives that now produce the perfect crimes. Uh, ladies. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Just following up on what you just said, Mr. Black, uh, the President of the United States calls you in tomorrow and says, uh, asks the question that I think Ms. Kaptur asked Professor Roberts, what do I do to fix this mess? Um, and no matter what I have to do, I'm going to do it, even if it's just one term, because I don't want to see my country go through this again. What would you do, Mr. Black? Professor One, Black. change your senior leaders of your effort because they don't believe in regulation. And who, you mean, you mean like the head of the... I mean Summers and I mean Geithner. Okay, all right. Two, we have a series of actings running most of our federal agencies and to the extent we don't, for example, Sheila Baer at FDIC trying to do things, we have Treasury fighting a war against Sheila Baer. Mm -hmm. Stop that. Put the Brooksley Bournes, the Sheila Bears, the Mike Patriarchas, a name you probably haven't heard of, in charge of these agencies. Increase the FBI immediately. Increase the Justice Department. Direct that the priority in these cases be against the large specialty entities. The FBI is currently has one fifth as many agents working this crisis as it had working the savings and loan crisis. And this crisis, the only question is how many orders of magnitude worse than the savings and loan crisis? It is a farce. They're being overrun. It is two and a half years since the secondary market collapsed. And there has not been a single indictment, much less conviction, of anyone for the loan related. There's a you know, specialized action on Bear Stearns on insider trading mostly, false disclosures. So we need to do those things. We need to fix executive compensation and not just executive compensation. It is what is destroying our system of appraisals. Is there anybody in America that doubts that they can get a highly inflated appraisal? Well, let me ask you this. Let me, I just, I'm going to stick right where you are. If we have a situation where, you know, when I look at this, uh, this the Wall Street crowd, I believe that there are certain things that may be illegal, but I believe that there are other things that are not illegal, but to me are unethical and wrong. And I don't, I'm not sure where the line is drawn there, but it seems to me that, I'll give you an example. Um, the New York Times reported last Friday that many former Freddie Mac employees had signed non-disclosure or secrecy agreements as part of their severance package. However, now both Freddie Mac and his government conservator, the Federal Housing Finance uh, Agency, are invoking those secrecy agreements in class action securities litigation lawsuits against the mortgage giant. Do you think such secrecy agreements are reasonable? Uh, corporate tactics, and while criminal investigations can penetrate these agreements, civil securities litigation can be thwarted by the silence of key departed decision makers. And so this certainly seems to, to run counter to your testimony on defeating fraud control. I'm just curious. I agree. I think that it is terrible public policy that those things should be void as against public policy. I'll give you an example. After I gave one of my talks on control fraud, a gentleman came up to me said, I was the guy that hired 
the elite MBAs for Exxon. And it's true that we lost a number of folks originally to Enron in those years. But you know what? I kept getting phone calls a year later, two years later, saying, is that job still open? This is not a place I want to be at. This kind of executive compensation, when it rewards fraud, think of what it creates as a culture. We assume tone at the top, right? Whenever we talk business ethics, it's incessantly tone at the top. When the tone at the top is a fraud, they create a culture of fraud. The folks at, X, at Enron were not the smartest guys in the room. They were the least moral guys left at the place after the best people had left. What? By the way, the average CFO in America lasts three years. Now, you can talk all you want about long-term perspective, but until we change that, it ain't going to happen. And that's one of the reasons why you're going to have very high turnover at any of these places. And you shouldn't assume that it's necessarily because Let me ask you this. Act. The money, when we see all these, say, Goldman Sachs uh, giving all of this money and bonuses and whatever, where could that, let's say it, the money didn't go there, would it then go to shareholders? And should shareholders be playing a bigger role? You follow what I'm saying? If you've got billions of dollars going out the door in bonuses, it seems to me that um, that money should be going somewhere, and the logical place for it to go would be shareholders. Well, it's worse than that, right? We first have gimmicked the accounting rules at the behest of the industry. And this is something, frankly, where Congress has culpability, in my view put pressure on FASB so that banks no longer have to recognize their losses. Second, there's a quotation in my testimony from Standard & Poor's about how they never, ever looked at the quality of the loans. Put those two things together. We are paying bonuses based on purported profits that are accounting gimmick numbers. Why? Why would we allow bonuses until they clean up the accounting and find the actual loan quality by reviewing the un a sample of the underlying loan files, which nobody is doing and which that farcical stress test never even looked at? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, let, let me um, uh, ask a couple of questions. Um, you know, Professor Black. You stated in your written testimony that Americans are not nearly as angry as they should be, uh, of course, uh, about executive compensation. If they knew more, they would be angrier. Could you look into the camera and in one or two sentences summarize what more they need to know or what more they need to do? <laughs> they need to know that it isn't merely a populism issue that it is the key driver along with non-regulation that produce recurrent intensifying crises and will do so again in the near term unless we fix it. They are producing perfect crimes and people will act on incentives. They will commit these perfect crimes. And the way you commit this perfect crime is to make huge amounts of bad loans with extreme leverage. What does that produce? It produces a bubble and it produces a crisis. And it does so whether you bail them out or not. You shouldn't bail them out. We agree on that. We agree that it makes the incentives worse. We agree on that. But it's not a necessary condition. All right. Here we are. Let's reverse positions for a moment. You know, you, you're now a member of Congress. When they come to us and, and they say that this particular company or is too big to fail, what do we do then? When they come and they tell you that, it's too big to fail. That's nonsense. Uh, and the idea that you could keep them alive if it were true is worse than nonsense, right? Because they've just defined these. In their lexicon, they want a good word, right? So they call them uh, systemically important, gold star, right? Sounds good. They are systemically dangerous institutions. 
by definition, if a single one of them fails under Treasury's logic, it causes a global economic crisis. Why would we allow such entities to exist and then unhinge further any discipline and maximize moral hazard? Why? It's like we were trying to produce a bigger and badder disaster. Right? So we have closed very large institutions in the past. We do it through receiverships. And we do a pass through receivership and the place opens. It closes on a Friday and it opens on a Monday and the ATMs work most of the weekend. Right? So it, this is something that can be done. What's lacking is the will. Professor Roberts, you want to add something to that? Yeah, uh, uh, tell a story. Uh, I was interviewing uh, Alan Meltzer for my weekly podcast, Econ Talk, and he mentioned that the power of FIDESHA, the FDIC Improvement Act, and he told me how it could have been used to help this transition to let some people go out of business. Some would have, some wouldn't have. And I said, well, why didn't anyone suggest that to the Treasury? And he said, I told Secretary Paulson that we should use FIDESHA, and he said, well, I asked the bankers and they were against it. <laughs> I guess they would be. So it really is a question of will and the challenge is, as you say, too big to fail. Well, well, guess who thinks they're too big to fail? The people whose money they want to get back and it's up to politicians and policymakers. It's up to Bernanke and Paulson and Geithner to say no. And Bear Stearns is a perfect example. Bear Stearns in March of 2008 was insolvent. There was a worry that it was going to have systemic risk. It's an interesting question whether it would or it wouldn't. I don't know. But when we decided to bail them out, Lehman Brothers, which had a very similar balance sheet, decided to double down. They borrowed more money because I think they thought they were going to be bailed out. And one of their largest lenders was a money market fund, which is supposed to be extremely conservative. Reserve Primary, that actually was the very first money market fund, was lending money to Lehman Brothers to finance their mortgage-backed securities. Why would they do that? I suggest it's because they thought probably they would get bailed out. Now, they weren't, as it turned out, the only one. And we've drawn the lesson that that was our mistake, that we didn't bail them out. I think our big mistake was bailing out Bear Stearns. And by the way, even when we bailed out, didn't bail out Lehman Brothers, the stock market didn't tank for a, for a week. Everyone said, oh, that was the crisis. That's when it started. It actually may have been when Secretary Paulson came up here and said, if you don't give me a blank check for $700 billion, the world's going to go to hell in a handbasket. We're going to have an apocalypse. The whole economy of the world is going to go to, to you know, going to be dissolved. That kind of scare talk, I think, had as big effect. John Taylor has written about this from Stanford in affecting how people behaved. So I think we've made some just terrible mistakes in not having the will to say no. Can I just add a second? It's not even a matter of deciding to use FIDISHA. The prompt corrective action law was passed after the savings and loan crisis in the belief that excessive regulatory forbearance had helped cause the price crisis. The act in general is mandatory, yeah. particularly for deeply insolvent places. But it has a terrible weakness we told people about back when they were considering it. It can be gamed by accounting. And it is gamed by accounting, and that's why these places aren't closed. But you actually tried to mandate it. I right. now yield five minutes to the um, gentleman from uh, California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is sort of anecdotal question, but do either one of you believe for a moment that the executives who took their deferred compensation that had become due, in other words, their accrued contracts before Mr. Feinberg took over, and they rolled them into future stock appreciation plans, meaning they rolled that many dollars into a plan that would mature in three to five years that would be, would essentially execute at the, the price of the stock. Do either of you believe that, for example, at B of A, that that wasn't simply people looking and saying, am I better off taking my money here or better off taking it here, realizing that the top 25 at Bank of America, I assume, are the most knowledgeable, best negotiators and, and smartest bankers on the planet, uh, notwithstanding the, the crisis. Well, remember, all bankers on the planet don't look as smart as they used to. But either, either of you doubt for a moment that when we went to negotiate that part, we were basically negotiating a, if it's better for you, you'll roll it over. If it isn't, you'll do something else uh, situation. The idea that we would 
uh, negotiate out existing contracts? Well, I was. Um, it's sort I was, of a comment I, on the quality of those people that we I, that well, I was, deal. I was deeply inspired by the special master's comments about his respect for the Constitution. They were then followed by a remark that he said, well, then, if they didn't voluntarily agree, we <laughs> wouldn't uh, we'd make them. Uh, so I think it's a very bad situation when the power of a single individual with no appeal and, again, very little transparency. We're, we're relying on the Wall Street Journal, unfortunately, to find out what's really going on. We'll find out in more detail how accurate that is, I assume. He disputes it, naturally. But I think it's a very, it's a very bad situation. I'm very sympathetic to Chairman Towns' point that, well, what alternatives do these folks have? Now, the standard view is, well, they're, they're, the, they're the best people in the business. They've got lots of alternatives. Uh, the alternatives are, are a lot smaller. They're a lot fewer than they used to be, right? So I think a lot of these folks were maybe doing the best they could. They certainly did the best they could for themselves. But you know, there's political pressure on, on the special master from them, lobbying him to do what's good for them. I agree. Uh, I wanted to just uh, continue the line you were already on, Professor Black, and that was uh, that our, our bailout was inherently the wrong statement. You know, in other words, we put in new money. We put it in as uh, uh, basically subordinated money. I mean, we're, we're preferred stock, and preferred stock comes after all debt. Do either of you doubt for a moment as a practical matter that the world would have been different had we come in and told the creditors and stockholders of these entities that we would come in only if we came in as senior uh, debt? In other words, we'll come in, we'll provide X amount, but you'll subordinate your existing debt in order for us to keep your companies alive. Wouldn't that have changed the dynamic dramatically of where we would be, which would be in the first position, what their interest would be to get us out so that their other uh, lenders and stockholders would have a value again? I realize there's some regulatory questions at FDIC about how you legitimize that as equity, not debt. But we had the power to call it whatever we wanted. We called it equity so that we could say that their capital position was improved. But Bill Isaac and other people who gave us lots of alternatives felt that we took every, we ignored every one except the one we took. And the one we took was the one that froze the markets when Secretary Paulson came in and said, you got to do it now. It's a crisis. We can't go the weekend. Would either of you comment on, on that alternative from a purely incentive basis to cause their, their interest to be aligned with ours? Okay. So I said not very nice things about Geithner and Summers. Let me add Paulson uh, to the <laughs> list as well. Uh, They're man, all going to have to write I would their own books. I would not want him negotiating on my behalf if I was the United States of America. And I don't believe that's how he acted when he was at Goldman. I think he was a very unfaithful agent to the interests of the American people. But, and, and Professor Black, I'm going to follow up on that. Uh, what I talked about earlier, the fact that Secretary Geithner's operation, maybe not him, but his operation at the New York Fed took a, an opportunity to negotiate credit defaults at some amount, probably 60 cents on the dollar, maybe less. They were certainly worth less at that point, and put 100 cents on the dollar on. Do you believe that the New York Fed acted in the best interest of the American people when they paid out 100 cents on the dollar with our tax dollars? Oh, I think they acted completely contrary to the interests of the American people. And more than that, why were we bailing out AIG anyway? AIG or, the, was or, never, at least the, or at least the British division. AIG was never federally insured. If uh, I'm a signatory with a number of folks, including some very conservative folks, about what we proposed had been, should have been done at AIG, which is a separate bankruptcy for the trading arm. Um, and it's these two things you've put together for a reason. In both cases, even if we were going to do a bailout, which we shouldn't have, we did it in a way that was incredibly harmful to the American people and so obviously harmful that an experienced Goldman Sachs executive would never do that accidentally. Or several of them. Professor Roberts. Yeah, uh, I think the key point is, is that the idea that you would only pay 50 cents on the dollar or 60 cents on the dollar, 80 cents on the dollar, any of those would have been better than, than the complete bailout of creditors because creditors are the people who restrain risk taking. They only care about one thing, a creditor, downside. They want to make sure the organization stays solvent. Stockholders get the upside benefit. So by taking the skin out of the game for creditors, which is what we've consistently done with these bailouts and the bailouts starting in 1984, 
continental Illinois basically says to creditors, lend money, you'll get it back in the worst case scenario. That's a disaster. So that story that you're talking about, which was reported by Bloomberg, that Tim Geithner, when he was head of the New York Fed, interrupted a negotiation where they were only going to pay 60 cents on the dollar and said, we'll pay the whole thing. It's terrifying. If a Martian came down and said, what is the U.S. financial system designed to do? I'm afraid they would say, it's designed to funnel money to Goldman Sachs. Now, that may not be true, but the fact that it looks to be true is not a healthy thing for no, a democracy. And in Thank the you. most um, opaque way possible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on, on that note, Mr. Chairman, uh, we continue uh, on a bipartisan basis to want to audit the Fed. So uh, that perhaps could be one of the things we gleaned from it. Mr. Chairman, uh, in closing, I just wanted to, to say that I think today's hearing has created an opportunity for us to revisit how we would effectively look at Freddie and Fannie and our friend Franklin Raines, their participation in the, uh, uh, the disaster that befell America. And I would ask that, uh, that we do some background discovery in preparation for a hearing where we could work together to, to find a common way to figure out what their role was and how to prevent it since, in fact, the GSEs are here for at least for the time being. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, gentlemen, yield. I yield back. Yeah. I yield. Yeah, yield. No, I mean, I understand your concerns. And, of course, um, uh, these are things that we can look at as we move forward. But also remember that we're running out of time in terms of uh, for this session. But anyway, <laughs> um, anyone on this side seeking to be recognized before I recognize Mr. Burton? Yes, uh, uh, Congresswoman uh, Capture. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, when I think back to last fall, uh, Mr. Paulson used a tactic of fear uh, that intimidated the Congress, in my opinion, and many people in the country. And the argument that was used was, if we don't do this uh, TARP and the bailout, the country would be worse off for it. And I keep looking back at what's happened, and I'm thinking, what could be worse in a district like mine than over 13 percent unemployment, foreclosures up by 94 percent, um, no credit being lent because the supervisory fees and uh, the FDIC fees being paid by the banks that didn't do anything wrong have gone up 20 times credit unions being asked to pay these exorbitant additional fees. They ground credit to a halt. I'm thinking, what could be worse than what's been done? And you're saying uh, that if we had resolved this in a different way, uh, perhaps the American people would have taken some nicks. But I'm saying to myself, didn't they do it in the worst way? And so um, my question to you is, how do you react to their argument that uh, today that, well, if we hadn't done that, it would be worse? Well, that's always the argument, right? They can always come back with that. The question is, are, one, the first question is, are they right? The second question is, did they actually make it better? Can we point to things they did to make it better? The thing I think that's often forgotten is the connection between uh, Wall Street and Main Street, right? The claim is, is that we hadn't saved these organizations, these financial giants, then there the, the, the turmoil would have spilled over into Main Street and the average America would have paid a, f a fierce price. As you point out, they paid a fierce price anyway. We have unemployment on the rise, headed towards double digits. We don't know, contrary to all the economists who think they can see the future, I, I wanted to let you know they can't. They don't know whether it's going to get better or not. We don't know if we're on the mend. And I would suggest that the single biggest mistake that we have made, whether it was for the right reasons or the wrong reasons, whether you're cynical or whether you're uh, an idealist, the biggest mistake we've made is that we have created an incredible environment of uncertainty about the future for both policy, compensation, who's running the auto industry, what's health care going to be, what's the environment. We have all this great stuff that we're trying to do, but no matter whether it's good or not, whether you agree with this piece or that piece, the fundamental situation is, is that for the average American business person who's got to take risks, put their own money on the line, outside of Wall Street, there's still this thing that if you go out of business, you lose all your money. So the biggest problem right now is that for small business and any business that's not on Wall Street, they're scared, and, and rightfully so. you know what they're doing, so. Dr. Roberts? They're talking about now going after this small business sector and securitizing any loans made to them. They're looking, it's a they're trying to vacuum what's left it's a mistake. in the country of equity again. It's a mistake. But my point is, is that because of the uncertainty about what's coming down the road in a desperate 
attempt to give people ad hoc power to fix it. As a result, we've created an atmosphere where people don't know what the rules of the game are. They can't plan for the future. Everybody's waiting to see, well, maybe I'll get mine. Maybe I'll get a bailout. Maybe I'll get a tax increase. Everybody's sitting on the sidelines waiting. And until that gets fixed, I would suggest that Main Street will not recover. All the stimulus money in the world, all the new improved this and that, until we get people confident about the future, we're not going to make progress. You know, and Dr. Black and Dr. Uh, Roberts, one, one effort that you might put in the area of game theory, if they had put you two in charge, even though you have different points of view on some things, you've come together on other ones, it would be very interesting for me and perhaps other members, going back to September, uh, involving others in our country. You mentioned Mr. Patriarca, or Patriarca, and I happen to think a lot of Mr. William Isaac, who resolved a lot of institutions back in the uh, 80s. Put some of those minds in the room and say, if you could unwind what was done and you could start from scratch, what would you have done, just in the form of game theory, to resolve these big ones? Because what, I'll tell you what's being said to us. Well, Congresswoman, you don't really understand because, you see, you never really understood credit default swaps and collateralized debt obligations. And because those were involved, we couldn't uh, resolve the institutions and take them into receivership as we normally would with the FDIC. So you get all this flack back. Well, the truth is they didn't know, <laughs> right? And the truth is this was an entire marketplace built on don't ask, don't tell, where no one, and I mean no one, looked at the underlying loan files until Fitch does in November 2007 because the secondary markets tanked and they're not going to lose any business. And then they say the results were disconcerting and that there was the appearance of fraud in nearly every file. And you could see it on the face of the files. So they don't want to look because what they're going to see in that box is a bad thing, not a good thing. So let's put the burden on them. Make them make the case publicly with full disclosure exactly why they made these decisions. Right. And yeah. what decisions they made, and when they made them, and who made them. A gentlewoman's time has expired. I now yield to the gentleman from Indiana, former chair of this committee, Mr. Burton. That's my picture up there. Do you think I look like that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank it's you, Mr. High Chairman. School I, picture. I apologize for being late getting back. <laughs> what was the answer to that? Your high school picture. <laughs> <laughs> You're in big trouble. <laughs> I apologize for not getting back quicker. We had two foreign affairs uh, meetings and I, I couldn't get back. Do you think that the uh, PAYSAR is constitutionally permissible? And uh, what, 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 do you th what do you believe the implications are for giving somebody this kind of authority, a czar like this? Either one of you. Um, I think it probably will pass a constitutional test, particularly with this Supreme Court. Um, I don't know that there's even going to be a challenge to it uh, on a timely basis. Uh, I think that everybody agrees it's not the right way, and it's not even a theory of second best. Maybe it's somewhere, you know, like twelfth best on the way to approach these things. Yeah. Um, but the best way was not to do nothing, right? What, what, in the what sense of allowing the incentives to remain perverse. If you're going to close the places, of course, that takes care of the perverse incentive. What, but what, if what you're do you, not... What do, you, what do you think about uh, the approach that he's taken by uh, reducing compensation for these people? Say a guy's making $13 million or $12 million, including his bonuses, and he says, we're going to cut your salary to $450,000 and we'll get the rest of you in stock as time goes by. What do you think that does to the... <laughs> The, the competent people that run these companies. What do you think is going to happen or what is happening? I know at AIG, I guess, uh, uh, or Bank of America, I've, I think it's Bank of America, I think they've lost half of their people, their top management people. Well, uh, se as I said, senior officers in America have incredibly short tenures without this program. CFOs average three years. So you're going to get huge turnover in these places, and turnover is particularly high on Wall Street because all of these guys have zero loyalty with an organization. You, you, you so they're don't think, always in play. You don't think this would uh, increase the likelihood that they would leave faster? 
Oh, I think it will increase the likelihood of some people. I mean, economics, we talk about things on the margin. On the margin, it's got to do that. But you, that's inevitable whenever you go to performance pay. Yeah, well, right? I, I would disagree with you. I think if I were a, a person who had that kind of a salary commitment and uh, they said they were going to come in and cut it to $450,000 a year, I would uh, <laughs> say, hey, you know, I think I'll go out on the street, take my 13 million bucks, and see if I can't get a job with the same kind of compensation. What do you think about that, Professor? Well, yeah, and I th well, some of them maybe they can't, which means you're you're stuck with whoever you got there. But I, as you say, I think a lot of them left because they saw the handwriting on the wall and they knew they could do better somewhere else, and they're gone. Uh, again, I want to emphasize that it's not clear that we want to try to get that money back. Obviously, the taxpayer would rather have more money than less money, yeah. but well, the idea that we're going to pour money into AIG or into Bank of America or into Citigroup with the idea that we got to get our money back, maybe they ought to disappear. What, 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 what does that do, though, to the management people who may have the talent and know-how to, to help get a company out of this kind of a mess, and uh, they leave and you go to second or third tier executives? Well, and you're counting on them looking forward to getting that stock bonus down the road in two to three to four years. What's their optimism about that if they know that the best people are gone? Right? It's really not a good system. Well, I just think if uh, the taxpayer, who are the stockholders, ought to be very concerned about having top-notch people in these executive positions to try to get some of their money back. I've got a couple more real quick questions. The Fed has indicated that, uh, that uh, they may start talking about expanding the salary uh, 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 conditions on all banks. Uh, what do you think about that and what do you think the possibility is? Well, everybody likes to have more power, except for the special master who said he doesn't want any more. He's only happy I know with, he says that. with seven. Well, that's what he said. Um, but the Fed, I'm sure, would, would grow and, and thrive looking over more people. I think, again, as I said before, I think that is the wrong way to fix the problem. The wrong way to fix the problem is to say, you're out of control. You take too much risk, so I'm going to take away some of your goodies so that you behave better in the future. It's not good for our financial system. It's not good for our capital system or, or investment. It's not good for productivity and innovation. As Professor Black said, a lot of people went out and took loans that they didn't investigate. Why would they do that? And the answer was because they had the incentive to do that. But what we have to keep our eye on the prize is that they were financing those lousy investments with borrowed money money from the other players in the game. Why would people lend folks money for lousy, risky loans? And the answer is because they thought they were going to get the money back. Yeah. We solved that problem. We don't have to have this top-down micromanaging of salaries, which is, forget whether it's possible. The yeah. political implications of it are extremely destructive. I, I have two more quick questions, and I'll let, uh, let the chairman uh, adjourn the meeting if he so chooses. Um, do you think Freddie Mac and Fannie May should uh, have the same kind of salary restrictions, restructuring done on, on them? Well, I think it's shocking that they don't. They, are, uh, they put us $100 billion in the red so far, and I think it's on the way to maybe 200 400 We don't really know. And I think if you do audit the Fed, I'd really like you to look at those yeah. uh, mortgages that they're holding because they're not marked to market. Yeah. Well, the thing that bothers me is that we've done this to these executives, and uh, they were responsible at least in part of this. but. Freddie, Freddie, May, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, have, they haven't done anything about that. And the last thing I'd like to ask, I'm sorry my time's out, is can you compare the crisis that we face now with the financial institutions to what happened in the SNL crisis back in the, I think, the late 80s? Uh, the crisis is vastly larger. It was a much easier crisis to stop. This was far more obvious. Um, and there was almost complete destruction of regulation this decade and it started in the decade before. And I see it as a spillover of, again, the same mistaken attempts to re for a free lunch. Everybody wants a free lunch. I want a, a very high return investment, but no risk, of course. I want it, I want it safe and extremely high, high rate of interest. That desire of the American people, of every human being, for that kind of free lunch should not be indulged. Well, they, handled, they handled the SNL crisis much differently than they did this one. That is correct, but the and it, roots and it of worked it, out. unfortunately, the roots of it are the same. An attempt to tell people there's no risk. You put your deposits in, don't worry about it. It's all taken care of. The government guarantees it. That government guarantee, explicit there, 
implicit with Fannie and Freddie, implicit with the investment banks, is the fundamental source of this problem. And it is a desire to deliver politically a free lunch. You will make your money, but no risk of loss. We ought to educate, and we ought to be treated like grown-ups. I'd like to be treated like a grown-up. I take my risk. I profit. If I make a good choice, I'm prudent. If I make a bad choice, I lose my money. That's what capitalism is about, and we've lost it. We got to get it back. Since I actually did it, I thank you. Tell thank you very much, um, gentlemen. Time has expired. I now yield to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much. Um, uh, earlier, I asked Mr. Feinberg um, where we're going from here. Um, he had expressed a hope that if he controlled the compensation for the seven companies, that others might, or it was his hope that they might follow by example. And I told him that I just don't see that happening. I just think, I just don't. Uh, I wish it, it, it would. And I'm just wondering, um, as I listen to you all talk about, you know, what you might do, it's hard for me to see some of those things happening. So what do you foresee? Let's be realistic. Let's assume the things that you talked about don't happen. Um, Mr. Black, Geithner's not gone in, going anywhere. I'm just telling you, probably not. And then the whole list of things. And I'm, and I'm not saying that, I'm not trying to take away from what you've said. So what do you foresee? Well, first, our motto was uh, it's not necessary to hope in order to persevere. <laughs> and uh, I would say the circumstances were vastly worse than the savings and loan crisis in terms of the correlation of political forces, right? The President Reagan's Justice Department threatened to indict the chairman of our agency criminally for re-regulating the industry under the Anti-Deficiency Act, under the argument that we were closing too many insolvent institutions, right? That's the world that we lived in. So I don't give up. I know these things seem improbable. I know that the forces you know, opposing us seem unbeatable. But America has not been characterized by crony capitalism, and it's up to us to keep it from going that route. And if we give up and we aim really low in terms of reforms, that's exactly what we'll get. Because the master is frankly wrong on that point you asked about. Some well-run corporations may, in fact, listen to him. That's not where the problem is. The problem is in the majority of corporations, that's what the statistics show, that deliberately and egregiously misalign the interests through their compensation system. They will not listen to the master. They will continue and they will continue to produce further crises whether or not we bail out the institutions. Mr. Black, well, I, on an optimistic note, whether most corporations or some corporations adopt the idea of incentivizing long-term incentives through stock holdings. Most, many corporations already do that. Most corporations, of course, some are flawed, some make mistakes, but most of them don't come to Washington with their hand out. That is a problem of right now the auto industry because of their special political pull and the financial sector through an even more special political pull, their long-term relationship with Washington. That's what has to be stopped. Now, on the optimistic side, um, true, Mr. Geithner's not going anywhere, but you, you here in Congress, you want to stay in office. You're going to listen to the American people. If the American people say, oh, we had to have these rescues, we have to recreate what we had before and make sure we stay like we did before, you're right, nothing's going to change. But if they say, which I think they are increasingly saying, we want to stop giving money to really rich people, and the right way to fix that is not to take it away at the last minute from seven of them, but to destroy the incentives that allowed them to take it in the first place, then I think we have a chance to really fix the problem. It's not going to be easy. As Professor Black said, uh, it's, a long, it's a long road. We all, I think, have, I hope, something to contribute, some of us very small bit, and some of you a lot larger. But it's, it's, not, it's not a force of nature. It is a matter of will. 
and that will be bolstered by the American people's outrage, not just at the fact that people make a lot of money, but the way they made it, through taking risks with money that was borrowed on the presumption that it would be paid back by the taxpayer. That is corrupt. That is the crony capitalism we have to stop, and it's in your hands. The next time you, you not you, but the, the, the Congress as a whole, the next time the Congress as a whole confirms a candidate for the chair of the Fed, or the Secretary of the Treasury, I'd like you to get them to make a commitment, they may not keep it, that they will not re return money dollar for dollar to lenders who make bad risks and finance bad bets. Ask them to commit to 50 cents on the dollar. Ask them to commit to encouraging losses. Now, they may not keep that promise, but that's where it starts. People putting at least their reputation on the line. And I think there's a hope there. The, um, when, we, um, when we see people uh, being thrown out of their homes and because of foreclosure and Washington Post just had an article saying how in some instances it's doubled over the last year and then you see people losing their jobs and what have you. Um, are you surprised that there's not more of a balance here? In other words, we hear about spending, uh, say for example, $180 billion for AIG, but we've got people in our district that it would probably take at best ten thousand dollars and they could stay in their homes and so that so that the american people just don't i mean it's hard for them to see they don't understand it it makes no sense um and i think that adds insult to injury and the loss of jobs of course savings etc that's why crony capitalism destroys democracies over time as well corrupts them people understand after a while that it isn't what they do, it's who they know. And one of the things that's unusual about America in polls is how few Americans have that view compared to other places. It's a really productive process not to have that view, to believe that merit really is something important. But it's perfectly rea rational as people see more and more cases of the rich getting bailed out to say no, it is mostly a matter of who you know. It's a sick system, and people start withdrawing from that system, and nations and even societies break down when it happens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you very much. Let me thank the gentleman from Maryland for uh, his, uh, his time has expired. Um, let me begin by thanking all the witnesses. Let me thank Mr. Feinberg, and of course, uh, let me thank you, Professor Black, and Professor Roberts. And let me thank the members on both sides of the aisle that attended the hearing. The American people are angry. They are angry that while millions of hardworking Americans are losing their homes and life savings, bank executives are rewarding themselves for failure. The idea that hundreds of thousands of dollars in salary plus millions of dollars in stock options is not enough for the executives bailed out by the American people is exactly the type of thinking that got us into this financial crisis in the first place. We need to link bank executives' compensation to performance. I've never seen or heard of people that fail getting a bonus. And of course, then the answer to it is that if we do not give them a bonus after they fail, they might leave. Well. I think that you should say goodbye. That is exactly what the special master and the Obama administration has done. Without this crucial link, we will continue to have perverse incentives for bank executives to take unjustified risk with taxpayers' money. This is unwise and unacceptable and must be stopped. Again, let me thank you for being here to witnesses and thank the members for attending. This committee is now adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you.
tomorrow morning.